Appendix 1, Philo, Concerning the World. Yonge's edition includes this treatise not found in Cone Wendland, Loeb. In a note, Yonge asserts that it is virtually identical to the Loeb treatise on the eternity of the world, which Yonge titled On the Incorruptibility of the World. There is no existing thing equal in honor to God, but he is the one ruler and governor and king, to whom alone it is lawful to govern and regulate everything, for the verse. A multitude of masters is not good, let there one sovereign be, one king of all, is not more appropriate to be said with respect to cities and men, and to the world and God, for it follows inevitably that there must be one creator and master, of one world, and this position having been laid down and conceded, as a preliminary, it is only consistent with sense to connect with it what follows from it of necessity. Let us now, therefore, consider what inferences these are. God being one being, has two supreme powers of the greatest importance. By means of these powers the incorporeal world, appreciable only by the intellect, was put together, which is the archetypal model of this world which is visible to us, being formed in such a manner, as to be perceptible to our invisible conceptions just as the other is to our eyes. Therefore some persons, marveling at the nature of both these worlds, have not only worshipped them in their entirety as gods, but have also deified the most beautiful parts of them, I mean for instance the sun, and the moon, and the whole heaven, which, without any fear or reverence, they called gods. And Moses, perceiving the ideas which they entertained, says, O Lord, King, of all gods, in order to point out the great superiority of the ruler to his subjects, and the original founder of the Jewish nation was a Chaldean by birth, being the son of a father, who was much devoted to the study of astronomy, and being among people, who were great studiers of mathematical science, who think the stars, and the whole heaven, and the whole world gods, and they say that both good and evil result from their speculations and belief, since they do not believe in anything, as a cause which is apart from those things which are visible to the outward senses. But what can be worse than this, or more calculated to display the want of true nobility existing in the soul, and the notion of causes in general being secondary and created causes, combined with that ignorance of the one first cause, the uncreated God, the creator, of the universe, who for these and innumerable other reasons is most excellent, reasons which, the cause of their magnitude human intellect is unable to apprehend? But this founder of the Jewish nation having conceived an idea of him in his mind, and looking upon him as the true God, forsook his native country, and his family, and his father's house, knowing that if he remained, the deceits of the polytheistic doctrine also remaining in his soul would render his intellect incapable of discovering the nature of the one God, who is alone everlasting, and the father of everything else, whether appreciable only by the intellect, or perceptible to the outward senses. But if he departed and emigrated, then he saw that deceit would also depart from his mind, which would then change its erroneous opinions into truth. And at the same time the oracular commands of God, which had been given to him, did further excite the desire which he felt to become acquainted with the living God. And he went forth like a man under the immediate guidance of others, with the most unhesitating promptness, to search after the knowledge of the one God. And he did not relax in his search, till he had derived at a more accurate and correct perception, not indeed of his essences, for that is impossible, but of his existence, and of his providence, on which account he is the first man of whom it is said that he believed in God. Since he was the first who had an accurate and positive notion of him, believing that there is one supreme cause of all things, which by his providence takes care of the world, and of all things, that are therein. Since the creator of the world bringing an essence previously without any order, and in complete confusion, into distinct order and regularity, began to arrange and adorn the earth, and the water, and established them in the middle of the world, and the trees, and air, and fire he drew up from the middle to the higher regions, and he fixed the regions of the aether all around, placing it as a boundary to, and a preserver of the things which were inside, from which also it derived its name of heaven. And these things, then, 
were the perfect seeds of the whole universe, but the great and all-productive tree raised from this seed is this world, of which the aforesaid branches are the offshoots. Where, then, God placed the roots, and what foundation it has upon which it is so firmly fixed like a statue, we must now consider. It is not natural that any body which is left behind should wander out of its limits, since God has made and arranged in its proper place the materials of the whole universe. For it was fitting that the greatest of all works, being also the most perfect, should be created by the greatest of all workmen. And it would not have been completely perfect if it had not been completed in perfect parts. So that if this world consists of every kind of material, nothing being beyond, and not even the most insignificant thing being omitted, it follows of necessity that whatever is outside the world must either be vacuum, or nothing at all. If it be a vacuum, then how can it be found to balance the world which is full, and closely packed, and the heaviest of all things, when there is nothing solid to support it? From which consideration it would appear to resemble a vision. Since the mind is always looking for a corporeal basis, it is natural to suppose that one whole should have such a thing, if it happens to be put in motion, and the world, above all things, inasmuch as it is the greatest of bodies, and, as it embraces in its bosom a multitude of other bodies, as its own appropriate parts. Therefore, if any one wishes to escape the perplexities which arise in treating of doubtful matters, let him speak his mind freely, and affirm that there is no material so strong, as to be able to support the weight of the world. But the eternal law of the everlasting God is the strong and lasting support of the universe. This law being extended from the center of the world to its furthest extremities, and again back from its extremities to the center, moves on in the unwearied irresistible course of nature, uniting and binding together all the parts of the universe. For the Father who established it made it to be the indissoluble bond of the universe. Therefore we are naturally led to conclude that the whole earth will not be dissolved by water which its bosoms contain, nor again will fire be extinguished by the air, nor again will the air be burned up and consumed by fire, since the divine law has placed itself as a boundary to keep all these elements distinct from one another. As yet the outproductive plant was not rooted, and had not the power which was to be derived from being rooted. But of the subordinate, particular, and less important plants, some were movable in such a way as easily to change their places, and some, without being liable to any change of places, were made as if they were to stand forever in the same position. Those therefore which are exposed to a motion which involves a change of place, which we call animals, were added to the most entire and perfect parts of the universe. The earth receiving the terrestrial animals, the water the aquatic animals, the air those creatures which fly, and the stars being assigned to the heaven. But the Creator created two different kinds both in the earth, and in the water, and in the air. In the air he placed those animals which fly, and other powers also which cannot by any means, or on any occasion, be comprehended by the outward senses. Thus the company of incorporeal souls is arranged in regular order according to their nature. For it is said that some of them are separated off and assigned to mortal bodies, and that, at certain definite and predetermined periods, they again depart from them. But that others of a more divine nature are utterly regardless of any situation in earth, but are raised to a great height, and placed in the aether itself, being of the purest possible character, which those among the Greeks, who have studied philosophy call heroes and demons, and which Moses, giving them a most felicitous appellation, calls angels, acting, as they do the part of ambassadors and messengers, announcing to the subjects all kinds of blessings from their rulers, and acting as servants to the king to whom they are subject, and they, descending into the body, as into a river, at one time are carried away by the violence of a most irresistible current, and swallowed up, and at other times, being wholly unable to resist the powers of destruction, at first, indeed, raise their heads, above the flood, and afterwards sink down again to the place from whence they have started. These, then, 
are the souls of those who devote themselves to the vigorous study of philosophy respecting divine subjects, from the beginning to the end of their existence studying things which may concern them after the life has left the body, that thus they may enjoy an incorporeal and endless life, in the presence of the uncreated and immortal God. But those souls of other men which I have spoken of as being overwhelmed, being such as have disregarded wisdom, giving themselves up to uncertain circumstances, such as depend wholly on chance, of which none have any reference to the soul, or to the intellect, but all to the body, which is but a corpse to which we are joined, or to other things even more inanimate and insensible than that, I mean such things as glory, and riches, and power, and honor, and all such other things as through the deceitfulness of false opinions are looked upon as real and living objects by people who do not see what is really beautiful. Therefore, if you look upon souls and demons and angels as things differing indeed in name, but as meaning in reality one and the same thing, you will thus get rid of the heaviest of all evils, superstition. For as people in general speak of good demons and bad demons, in the same manner also do they speak of good and bad souls, and so they speak of some angels as being by their title worthy ambassadors from men to God, and from God to men, being sacred and inviolable guardians on account of their blameless and most excellent service which they have allotted to them. And, again, if you look upon others as unholy and unworthy of any such appellation, you will not err. And the psalmist himself is a witness in favor of what I have he reserted, where he speaks, as follows, he sent among them the anger of his wrath by the operation of evil angels. Again, all animals that swim and zoophytes are allotted to the water, and all terrestrial animals and plants to the land. And the plants he placed with their heads downwards, fixing their heads in the deepest parts of the earth, but the heads of the irrational animals he dragged up from the earth, and placed upon a lofty neck, placing the four feet beneath them as a kind of pedestal. But man has had a separate formation of a higher character, for in the case of other animals, God has placed their eyes in the side of their heads, and bent them down to the ground, on which account they are all inclined downwards to the earth. But the eyes of man, on the other hand, he has raised up, that he might behold the heavens, being not a terrestrial, but a celestial planned, as the old saying is. But the other class, who affirm that our intellect is a portion of ethereal nature, connect man, in a relationship with the air. Accordingly, the great Moses has not spoken of the rational soul, as it resembled in its species any created thing, but he has called it the image of the divine and invisible God, looking upon it to be a glorious and carefully wrought image, the seal of God, the character of which is the everlasting word, for, says he, God breathed into his face the breath of life, so that it follows inevitably that he who received it must be made in the image and likeness of him who sent it. On which account he also says that man was created in the image of God, and not in the likeness of any created thing. But, taking up our discourse again at the beginning for the sake of clearness, let us say that of bodies some have put on habit, and others nature, and others soul, and others a rational soul. Therefore those stocks and stones which are torn from any intimate connection have made for themselves that strongest of all forms, namely habit, and that is a breath returning constantly to itself, for it begins at the center and extends to the furthest extremities, and when it has touched the outermost circumference it turns back again until it arrives at the same place from which it originally started. This had he continued course of habit over which it runs and returns, and he has allotted the nature of their own to plants, having combined it of many powers, especially the nutritious and the generative power, and the Creator has made the soul different from nature in three particulars the outward sense, and fancy, and impulse. Now plants have no participation in any of these things, but every living animal has a share in all of them. Therefore the outward sense, as its very name in my opinion shows, is a certain imposition which represents to the intellect the things which have appeared to it and it represents to the fancy a sort of outline in the soul, being, as it were, a kind of representation of light, 
for those things which each of the outward senses has introduced, like ring, as it were, or seal, it impresses on them its own character, or else it preserves the impression which has been made until the arrival of memory, forgetfulness, having softened the impression, at least makes it very dim, or else entirely effaces it. And what has appeared to have been impressed upon it disposes the soul at one time, as if it belonged to it, and at another time, as if it belonged to some other. And this feeling is called impulse, which those who have attempted to give accurate definitions have called the primary motion of the soul. In such important particulars are animals superior to plants. Let us now therefore see in what man is superior to the other animals. He now has received, as an especial and preeminent honor, the gift of intellect, by which he is accustomed to comprehend the natures of all things, whether they be bodies or things, for, as the predominant part, in the body is the sight, and, as the nature of light is the most important part of the universe. So in the same manner the most important and influential of all the parts in us is the mind, for this is the light of the soul. Being irradiated and enlightened by its own beams, by which that dense and profound darkness, ignorance of facts which was shed around it, is dissipated. And this portion of the soul is not composed of the same elements as those of which the other parts are made, but it has a pure and more excellent essence, from which the divine natures were made, on which account the intellect alone, of all the parts within us, appears very reasonably, and naturally to be imperishable, for that is the only portion which the Father, who generated it has thought worthy of freedom, and loosing the bands of necessity. He has allowed it to roam at large without restraint, having endowed it with a share of his own most glorious, and becoming attribute, free will, the highest present which it was able to receive. For the other animals in whose souls there does not exist that intellect which is thus especially appropriated to freedom, have been given up to them to submit to their yoke, and to receive their bridle in their mouths, so, as to serve them as servants obey their masters. But man having a spontaneous will, subject to no promptings, but those of his own nature, and exerting his energies in accordance with his own deliberate purpose, is very properly subject to blame for whatever unjust actions he commits from deliberate intention, and to praise for all the good deeds which he intentionally performs, for, as he has received from God a power of voluntary motion, and, as he is in this respect, like unto God himself, being delivered from all subservience to that most severe and grievous mistress, necessity. He very properly is open to accusation, when he does not pay worship to that being, who has thus delivered him. Therefore he will most justly in such a case suffer the punishment which has been inexorably pronounced against ungrateful people who do not deserve freedom. On which account also, the body being raised up towards the purest portion of the universe, the heaven raises its size upwards, that so by an observation of what is visible, it may arrive at an adequate comprehension of what is invisible. Since, therefore, it would be impossible to behold the attraction of the intellect towards the living God, excepting as far as those who are attracted towards him can themselves perceive it, for each man, in an individual and a special degree knows what happens to himself, he has made a visible image of the invisible eye, namely, the eyes of the body which are thus able to look towards the sky. For when the eyes, which are made of perishable materials, have gone to such heights as even to soar upwards, to the heaven which is removed to such an immense distance, from the regions of the earth, and to touch its borders, to how great a distance must we not suppose that the eyes of the soul can reach? Which, being excited by a vehement desire, to see the one being clearly, and distinctly, stretch forward not only to the furthest extremity of the sky, but, leaving beneath them the boundaries of the universal world, hasten onwards to the uncreated. Having now, therefore, gone through the whole question of the more important plants in the world, let us see in what manner also the all-wise God has fashioned the trees which exist in man, that lesser world. Therefore immediately having taken our body, as a region of fertile soil, he has made in it the outward senses as so many channels, and then he has carefully trained each of those outward senses, 
as a plant susceptible of cultivation and of the greatest use in planting the sense of hearing in the ears and that of seeing in the eyes and that of smell in the nostrils and all the other senses in the places akin to and appropriate to them. And I have a witness in favor of this my argument in that God, like man, who speaks thus in the Psalms, he that planted the ear shall he not hear, and he that fashioned the eye must not he see. Moreover, those other faculties which reside apart from the main body, being situated in the legs and hands, and the other parts of the body, whether within or without all these faculties, I say, are noble and excellent offshoots. And the more excellent and more perfect parts he very appropriately stationed near the dominant portion of the whole, as being in the center, and able preeminently to bring forth fruit, as being the lord of the whole. And these faculties are perception and comprehension, and felicity of conjecture, and study, and recollection, and habit, and disposition, and every variety of art, and certainty of knowledge, and an ever mindful apprehension of the speculations of every kind of virtue. Now, no one can properly or sufficiently cultivate any one of these within, but the one uncreated maker of them, and who has not merely created them, but who also makes all these plans to correspond to everything which takes place, he alone can manage them, and perfect them, as they should be perfected. And the way in which paradise was planted is in strict conformity with what has been here said, for we read that God planted a paradise in Eden, towards the east, and there he placed the man, whom he had made. Now, to think that this means that God planted vines and olives, and trees of apples and pomegranates, and things of that kind, is great and incurable folly. But in order that no one might imagine that the Creator had need of anything that he had created, Moses has made a most important declaration, when he says, The Lord, the King of ages, forever and ever. Accordingly, God is both the Father, and the Creator, and the Governor, in reality and truth, of all the things, that are in heaven, and in the whole world. And, indeed, the future is concealed and separated from the present moment at one time, by a brief, and at another time by a long interval. But God is also the Creator of time, for He is the Father, of that which is the Father of time, and the Father of time is the world, which proves that its own birth is the motion of time. But nothing is future to God, because he is in possession of and the author of the boundaries of time, for it is not time, but rather the archetype and model of time. But in eternity nothing is past, nothing is future, but everything is at the present moment. Having now, then, discussed these matters at sufficient length, we must proceed to investigate its imperishableness. Now, there are three opinions in vogue among the philosophers on this subject, some affirming it is everlasting, and uncreated, and free from all liability to destruction, others, on the contrary, that it is created, and perishable. There is also a sect which has adopted some portions of the doctrine of each of the before-mentioned parties, taking from the latter sect the doctrine that it is created, and from the former the idea that it is imperishable, and thus they have left a mixed opinion, looking upon it as at the same time created, and yet imperishable. Therefore Democritus, and Epicurus, and the chief body of the philosophers of the Stoic school, believe the generation, and also the destructibility of the world, but they do not all do so in the same manner. For some give a sketch of many worlds, the creation of which they attribute to the concourse, and conflict in combination of atoms, and their destruction they attribute to the repercussion, and shattering of what has been thus formed. But the Stoics affirm, that there is one world, and that God is the cause of its creation, but that God is not the cause of its destruction, but that the power which is contained in existing things, in the long periods of never-ending time, attracts everything to itself, from which again a regeneration of the world is caused by the prudence of the Creator. But Aristotle pronounced the world to be both uncreated and imperishable, and he affirmed that those who maintained a contrary doctrine were guilty of terrible impiety, as they considered that so great a work of God was in no respect superior to things made by the hand of men. 
and they say to that it has been proved to be both uncreated and imperishable by Plato, in his Timaeus. But some persons interpret Plato's words sophistically, and think that he affirms that the world was created, not in as much, as it has had the beginning of creation, but in as much, as if it had been created it could not possibly have existed in any other manner, and that in which it actually does exist, as has been described, or else, because it is in its creation and change, that the parts are seen. But the forementioned opinion is better and truer, not only, because throughout the whole treatise he affirms that the creator, of the gods is also the father and creator and maker of everything, and that the world is a most beautiful work of his and his offspring, being an imitation visible to the outward senses of an archetypal model appreciable only by the intellect, comprehending in itself as many objects of the outward senses, as the model does objects of the intellect. Since it is a most perfect impression of a most perfect model, and is addressed to the outward sense as the other is to the intellect. But also, because Aristotle bears witness to this fact in the case of Plato, who, from his great reverence for philosophy, would never have spoken falsely. But some persons think that the father of the Platonic theory was the poet Hesiod as they conceive that the world is spoken of by him as created, and indestructible, has created, when he says, dash first did chaos rule, then the broad-chested earth was brought to light, foundation firm, and lasting for whatever exists among mankind, and as indestructible, because he has given no hint of its dissolution or destruction. Now chaos was conceived by Aristotle, to be a place, because it is absolutely necessary that a place to receive them must be in existence before bodies. But some of the Stoics think, that it is water, imagining that its name has been derived from effusion. But however that may be, it is exceedingly plain that the world is spoken of by Hesiod, as having been created, and a very long time, before him Moses, the lawgiver of the Jews, had said in his sacred volumes, that the world was both created, and indestructible, and the number of the books is five. The first of which he entitled Genesis, in which he begins in the following manner, In the beginning God created the heaven, and the earth, and the earth was invisible, and without form. But we must place those arguments first which make out the world to be uncreated and indestructible because of our respect for that which is visible, employing an appropriate commencement. To all things which are liable to destruction there are two causes of that destruction, one being internal, and the other external, therefore you may find iron, and brass, and all other substances of that kind destroyed by themselves, when rust, like a creeping disease, overruns, and devours them, and by external causes, when, if a house, or a city is burnt, they also are consumed in the conflagration, being melted by the violent impetuosity of the fire, a similar and also befalls animals, partly when they are sick of diseases arising internally, and partly when they are destroyed by external causes, being sacrificed, or stoned, or burnt, or when they endure an unclean death by hanging. And if the world also is destroyed, then it must of necessity be so either by some external cause, or else by some one of the powers which exist within itself. And both these alternatives are impossible, for there is nothing whatever outside of the world, since all things are brought together in order to make it complete and full, for it is in this way, that it will be one, and whole, and free from old age, it will be one, because if anything were left outside of it, then another world might be created resembling that which exists now, and whole, because the whole of its essence is expended on itself, and exempt from old age, and from all disease, since those bodies which are liable to be destroyed by disease, or old age are violently overthrown by external causes, such as heat, and cold, and other contrary qualities, no power of which is able to escape so as to surround and attack the world, all those being entirely enclosed within, without any part whatever being separated from the rest. But if indeed there is any external thing it must by all means be a vacuum, or else a nature absolutely impossible, which it would be impossible should either suffer, or do anything. And again, it will also not be dissolved by any cause existing within itself, 
first of all because, if it were, then the part would be greater and more powerful than the whole, which is the greatest possible absurdity, for the world, enjoying an unsurpassable power, influences all its parts, and is not itself influenced or moved by any one of them, in the second place, because, since there are two causes of corruption, the one being internal, and the other external, those things which are competent to admit the one must also by all means be liable to the other, and a proof of this may be found in oxen, and horses, and men, and other animals of similar kinds, because it is their nature, to be destroyed by the sword, or to be liable to die by disease. Since, therefore, the arrangement of the world is such, as I have endeavored to describe it, so that there is no part whatever left out, so, as for any force, to be applied, it has now been proved that the world will not be destroyed by any external thing, because in fact nothing whatever external has been left at all, nor will it be destroyed by anything in itself on account of the proof which has already been considered and stated. According to which that which was obnoxious to the power of one of those causes was also naturally susceptible of the influence of the other. And there are testimonies also in the Timaeus to the fact of the world being exempt from disease and not liable to destruction, such as these, accordingly, of the four elements the constitution of the world receives each in all its integrity, for he who compounded it made it to consist of the whole of fire, and the whole of water, and the whole of air, and the whole of earth, not leaving any portion or any power of any one of them outside from the following intentions in the first place, in order, that the whole might be as far as possible a perfect animal made up of perfect parts. And besides all these things, he ordained that it should be one, inasmuch, as there is nothing left out of which another similar world could be composed. Moreover, he willed that it should be exempt from old age, and free from all disease, considering that those things which in the body are hot or cold, or which have mighty powers, if standing all around and falling upon it unseasonably, would be likely to dissolve it, and, by introducing diseases, and old age, cause it to decay and perish. For this cause, and because of this reason, God made the whole universe, to consist of entire, and perfect elements, and exempt from old age, and free from disease? Let this be taken, as a testimony delivered by Plato, to the imperishable nature of the world. Its uncreated character follows from the truth of natural philosophy, for dissolution must of necessity attend everything which is born, and incorruptibility must inevitably belong to everything which is unborn, since the poet, who wrote the following iambic verse, all that is born must surely die, appears to have spoken very correctly when he asserted this connection of destructibility with birth. The argument may be stated in a different way as follows. All compound things which are destroyed are dissolved into the elements of which they were compounded. Accordingly, dissolution is nothing else but a return of everything to its original constituent parts, just as, on the contrary, Composition is that which compels the things combined to come together in a manner contrary to their nature, and indeed, this appears to be the most exact truth, for men are composed of the four elements which together make up the whole of the universe, the heaven, the earth, the air, and fire. Borrowing a few parts of each in a manner at first sight hardly consistent with nature, but the things which are thus combined together are necessarily deprived of emotion in accordance with nature, for instance, warmth is deprived of its upward motion, and coldness of its downward tendency, the earthy and somewhat weighty substance being lightened, and assuming the higher place, which the most earth-like of our own parts, the head, has obtained in us but, of all bonds, that is the worst which is forged by violence, and which, being violent, is also short-lived for it is speedily broken by those who are bound in it, since they become restive from their desire. For emotion in accordance with nature, to which they hasten, for, as the tragic poet says, dash and for things sprung from earth, they must return, unto their parent dust, while those from heavenly seed which rise are born uplifted to the skies. Not that has once existed dies, though often what has been combined before, we separated find, invested, with another form. 
and this law and ordinance is established with reference to everything which is destroyed, that wherever composite things are existing in combination they are thrown into disorder instead of into the order in accordance with nature, which they previously enjoyed, and they are removed to situations opposite to those in which they were previously placed, so that they seem in a manner to be sojourners, and when they are dissolved again, then they return to the appropriate parts allotted to them by nature. But since the world has no participation in that irregularity which exists in the things which I have just been mentioning, let us stop a while and consider this point. If the world were liable to corruption and destruction, it follows of necessity that all its parts would at present be arranged in a position not in accordance with nature, but it is impious even to imagine such a thing as this for all the parts of the world have received the most excellent position possible, and an arrangement of the purest symmetry and harmony, so that each individual part, being content with its place, as a native country, to it, does not seek any change for the better. On this account it is that the most central position of all has been assigned to the earth, to which all things belonging to it adhere, and to which they descend again even if you throw them into the air. And this is a proof that their place is in accordance with nature, for wherever anything is born without any violence, and where it then remains for man stationary, that is clearly its natural place. And then, in the second place, water was poured over the earth, and air and fire have gone from the central to the upper part, air having received for its portion the region which is on the borders between air and fire, and fire having received the highest place of all, on which account. If you light a torch, and press it down towards the ground, nevertheless the flame will still turn in a contrary direction, and lightening itself in accordance with the natural motion of fire, will rise upwards. If, then, motion contrary to nature is the cause of corruptibility and destruction in the case of other animals, but if in the case of the world every one of its parts is arranged in complete accordance with nature, having had appropriate positions allotted to each of them, then surely the world must most justly be pronounced incorruptible and imperishable. Moreover this point is manifest to every one, that every nature is desirous to keep and preserve, and if it were possible to make immortal, everything of which it is the nature, the nature of trees, for instance, desires to preserve trees, and the nature of animals desires to preserve each individual animal. But particular nature is of necessity unable to conduct what it belongs to to eternity, for want, or heat, or cold, or innumerable other ordinary circumstances, when they affect particular things, shake them, and dissolve the bond which previously held them together, and at last break them to pieces. But if nothing resembling any of these things were lying in wait outside, then in that case nature itself, as far as it is possible, would preserve everything both great and small free from old age. It follows therefore of necessity that the nature of the world must desire the durability of the universe, for it is not worse than particular natures, so that it should run away and desert its proper duties and attempt to produce disease instead of health and corruption and destruction instead of complete safety since, high, over all she lifts her beauteous face, and towers above her nymphs with heavenly grace, fair, as they all appear. But if this be true, then the world cannot be capable of destruction. Why so? Because the nature which holds it together is itself invincible by reason of its exceeding strength and power, by which it gets the mastery over everything else which might be likely to injure it, wherefore Plato has well said, for nothing ever departed from it, nor did anything ever come to it from any quarter, for that was not possible, for there was nothing in existence which could come, for since it supplies itself with nutriment out of its own consumption. It also does everything, and suffers everything in itself, and by itself, and is compounded with the most consummate art. For he who created it thought that it would be better if wholly self-sufficient, and if in continual need of accessories from other quarters. However, this argument also is a most demonstrative one, on which I know that vast numbers of philosophers pride themselves, as one most accurately worked out, and altogether irresistible, for they inquire what reason there is for God's destroying the world. 
for if he destroys it at all he must do so either with the intention of never making a world again, or with the object of creating a second fresh one. Now the former idea is inconsistent with the character of God, for it is proper to change disorder into order, and not order into disorder. In the second place, it is so because it would give rise to repentance, which is an affliction, and a disease of the soul. For he ought either never to have created a world at all, or else, if he judged that it was a fitting employment for him, he ought to have been pleased with it after it was made. But the second reason deserves no superficial examination, for if he were intending to make another world instead of that which exists at present, then of necessity the second world that would be made, in that case, would be either worse than, or similar to, or better than the first, every one of which ideas is inadmissible, for if the new world is to be worse than the former then the maker must be also worse, but all the works of God are without blemish, beyond all reproach, and wholly faultless. Inasmuch as they are wrought with the most consummate skill and knowledge, for, as the proverb says, dash for in a woman's wisdom's not so coarse as to despise the good and choose the worse. But it is consistent with the character of, and becoming to God, to give form to what is shapeless, and to invest what is most ugly with admirable beauty. Again, if the new world is to be exactly like the old one, then the maker is only wasting his labor, and differs in no respect from infant children, who, very often while playing on the seashore raise up little mounds of sand, and then pull them down again with their hands, and destroy them, for it would have been much better than making another world exactly like the former, neither to take anything from, nor to add anything to nor to change either for the better or for the worse what existed originally, but to let it remain just as it was. If, on the other hand, he is about to make a world better than the former one, then the maker too must be better than the maker of the former world, so that when he made the former world he was inferior both in his skill and in his intellect, which is impious even to imagine, for God is at all times equal and similar to himself, being neither capable of any relaxation which can make him worse, nor of any extension which can make him better. Men, indeed, do admit of such inequalities in either direction, being naturally liable to alter either for the better or for the worse, and continually admitting of increase, and advance, and improvement, and everything contrary to these states, and besides this, the works of us, who are but mortal men may very appropriately be perishable, but the works of the immortal must, in all consistency and reason be likewise imperishable, for it is natural that what is made should resemble the nature of the Maker. But Boethus uses the most convincing arguments, which we shall proceed to mention immediately, for if, says he, the world was created, and is liable to destruction, then something will be made out of nothing which appears to be most absurd even to the Stoics. Why so? Because it is not possible to discover any cause of destruction, either within or without, which will destroy the world. For on the outside there is nothing except perhaps a vacuum, inasmuch as all the elements in their integrity are collected and contained within it, and within there is no imperfection so great as to be the cause of dissolution to so great a thing. Again, if it is destroyed without any cause, then it is plain that from something which has no existence will arise the engendering of destruction, which is an idea quite inadmissible by reason, and, indeed, they say that there are altogether three generic manners of corruption, one which arises from division, another which proceeds from a destruction of the distinctive quality which holds the thing together, and the third from confusion, Therefore the things which consist of a union of separate members, such as flocks of goats, herds of oxen, choruses, armies, or, again, bodies which are compounded of limbs joined together, are dissolved by disjunction and separation. But wax, when stamped with a new impression, or softened before being remodeled so as to present new and different appearance, is corrupted by a destruction of the distinctive quality which previously held it together. Other things are corrupted by confusion, as the medicine which the physicians call tetrapharmicon, for the powers of the drugs brought together and combined were destroyed in such a manner, as to produce one perfect medicine of especial virtue. By which, then, 
of these modes of corruption is it becoming to say that the world is destroyed by that which is caused by separation? No, for it is not compounded of separate members so that its different parts can be dispersed, nor of portions joined together so that they can be dissolved, nor is it united together in a similar manner to our own bodies, for they have the seeds of decay in themselves, and they are subject to influence of a great variety of things by which they are at times injured. But the power of the world is invincible, since by its great superiority to other things it has dominion over everything. Is it then destroyed by a complete destruction of its distinctive qualities? This again is impossible, for there remains, as the adversaries affirm, a quality of arrangement which by the process of conflagration is only diminished to a lesser substance, is it destroyed then by confusion? Away with such an idea, for in that case it would be necessary to confess that the corruption of a body can be reduced to a state of non-existence. Why so? Because if each of the particular elements were destroyed separately, it would be possible for it to become changed into another. But if they are altogether destroyed at one and the same moment by confusion, then it would be necessary to imagine what is absolutely impossible. Is it not however worthwhile to examine this question, in what manner there can be a regeneration of all those things which have been destroyed by fire, and resolved into fire? For when their substance has been wholly destroyed by the fire, it follows of necessity that the fire itself must also be extinguished as no longer having any nourishment. Therefore, as long as it remained the seminal principle of arrangement was likewise preserved, but when it is destroyed that principle is destroyed with it. But it would be impious and an impiety of double die, not only to attribute destruction to the world, but also to take away the possibility of its regeneration, as if God delighted in disorder and irregularity, and all kinds of evil things. But we must examine this question more accurately, in the following manner. There are three species in fire, the coal, and the flame, and the light. Now coal is the fire in its earthy substance, which, like a sort of spiritual habit, couches, and lies hid in a sort of cavern, pervading it all to its very extremities. And the flame is that part which, being raised on high, is lifted up from its fuel. And the light is that which is emitted from the flame, so, as to cooperate with the eyes, in order to enable them to comprehend what is seen. And the flame occupies the middle position between the coal and the light, for when it is extinguished it ends in coal, and when it is kindled it excites the light, which, being deprived of its burning power, blazes. If therefore, we affirm that the world is dissolved by conflagration, it would not be coal, because, in that case there will be a great deal of the earthy substance left behind, in which also fire must necessarily be contained. But we must agree, that none of the other bodies subsist any longer, but that earth, and water, and air, are all dissolved into unmixed fire. Nor, again, would it become flame, for that can only exist in connection with nourishment, and, if nothing is left behind, being deprived of all nourishment it will immediately be extinguished. It follows from all this, that it cannot become light either, for light by itself has no substance at all, but flows from the things, before mentioned, coal and flame, not in a great degree from the coal, but very much from the flame, for it is diffused over a very great space indeed, but if, as has been already proved, those things had no existence from the conflagration of all things, then there could not be any light either. So that it is impossible for the world to be susceptible of any regeneration, inasmuch as there is no spermatic principle smoldering beneath, from which consideration it is plain that it is uncreated, and that it will be forever imperishable. However, Besides what has been here said, anyone may use this argument also in corroboration of his opinion, which will certainly convince all those who are not determined to be obstinate beyond all bounds, of those things which in pairs are exactly contrary to one another it is impossible that one thing should be, and that the other should not be, for since there is white it follows, as a matter of absolute necessity, that there must also be black. 
and since there is a great there must likewise be a little, since there is an odd there must inevitably be an even, since there is a sweet there must be a bitter, since there is day there must be night, and so on in an infinite number of similar cases. But if a conflagration should take place, then something would ensue which is impossible for the of things. In a pair, the one will happen, and the other will not. Come, now, let us consider the matter thus, if everything is resolved into fire. There is then something light, and rare, and warm, for all these are the especial properties of fire. But there can be nothing heavy, or cold, or thick, which are the opposites of the qualities which I have just enumerated. How then can any one more completely overturn the idea of the universal disorder which would be involved in such a conflagration, than by showing that those things which by a law of nature must exist together, are by this process separated from their natural conjunction. And the separation has extended to such a degree, that those who maintain this doctrine attribute eternal durability to the one and deny any existence at all to the other. Again, there is this assertion made by some of those who diligently employ themselves in investigating truth which appears to me to be a sufficiently felicitous one, if the world is destroyed it will either be destroyed by some other efficient cause, or by God, now there is certainly nothing else whatever from which it can receive its destruction, for there is nothing whatever which it does not surround, and contain. But that which is surrounded and confined within something else is manifestly inferior in power to that which surrounds, and confines it, by which it is therefore mastered. On the other hand, to say that it is destroyed by God is the most impious of all possible assertions, for God is the cause not of disorder, and irregularity, and destruction, but of order, and beautiful regularity, and life, and of every good thing as is confessed by all those whose opinions are based on truth. But some of those persons who have fancied that the world is everlasting, inventing a variety of new arguments, employ also such a system of reasoning as this to establish their point. They affirm that there are four principal manners in which corruption is brought about, addition, taking away, transposition, and alteration. Accordingly, the number two is by the addition of the unit corrupted so as to become the number three, and no longer remains the number two. And the number four by the taking away of the unit is corrupted so as to become the number three. Again, by transposition the letter Z becomes the letter H, when the parallel lines which were previously horizontal, slash slash, are placed perpendicularly, slash slash and when the line which did before pass upwards, so, as to connect the two is now made horizontal, and still extended between them so as to join them. And by alteration the word oinos, wine, becomes oxos, vinegar. But of the manner of corruption thus mentioned there is not one which is in the least degree whatever applicable to the world, since otherwise what could we say? Could we affirm, that anything is added to the world so? as to cause its destruction. But there is nothing whatever outside of the world which is not a portion of it as the whole, for everything is surrounded, and contained, and mastered by it. Again, can we say, that anything is taken from the world so, as to have that effect? In the first place that which would be taken away would again be a world of smaller dimensions, and the existing one, and in the second place it is impossible that any body could be separated from the composite fabric of the whole world so as to be completely dispersed. Again, are we to say, that the constituent parts of the world are transposed? But at all events they remain in their original positions, without any change of place. For never at any time shall the whole earth be raised up above the water, nor the water, above the air, nor the air, above the fire. But those things which are by nature heavy, namely the earth, and the water, will have the middle place, the earth supporting everything like a solid foundation, and the water being above it, and the air, and the fire, which are by nature light, will have the higher position, but not equally. For the air is the vehicle of the fire, and that which is carried by anything is of necessity, above that which carries it. Once more, we must not imagine that the world is destroyed by alteration, for the change of any elements is equipollent, and that which is equipollent is the cause of unvarying steadiness, and of untroubled durability, inasmuch, 
as it neither seeks any advantage itself, and is not subject to the inroads of other things which seek advantages at its expense, so that this retribution and compensation of these powers is equalized by the rules of proportion, being the produce of health, and endless preservation. By all which considerations the world is demonstrated to be eternal. Theophrastus, moreover, says that those men, who attribute a beginning and destructibility to the world are deceived by four particulars of the greatest importance, the inequalities of the earth, the retreat of the sea, the dissolution of each of the parts of the universe, and the destruction of different terrestrial animals and their kinds, and he proceeds to establish the first point thus, if the earth had never had any beginning of its creation then there would have been no portion of it rising above the rest so as to be conspicuous, but all the mountains would have been level, and all the pieces of rising ground would have been even with the plain. For as there are such vast showers falling from heaven throughout all ages, it would be natural that of any places which were originally raised on high some would be broken down and washed away by torrents, and others would subside of their own accord, and so become lowered, and that every place everywhere would be smoothed. But now, as things are, the constant inequalities which exist and the vast heights of many mountains, reaching up even to the sky, are so many proofs that the earth is not eternal. For otherwise, as I have said before, all the earth would long since have been rendered level from one extremity to the other by the vast rains which would have fallen from the eternal commencement of time, for it is the character of the nature of water, and especially of such as descends in a heavy fall from lofty places to push some things away by force, and to cut out hollow others places by its continual dropping, and in this manner, to operate on the hard, rugged, stony ground not less than men digging. And again, the sea, as they affirm, is already somewhat diminished, and for proof of this fact we can appeal to the most celebrated islands, roads, and delos for these were in ancient times invisible, being overwhelmed by and sunk under the sea, but by lapse of time, as the sea gradually diminished, they by slow degrees rose above it and came into sight, as the histories which are written concerning them record. And they used to call Delos a knave, confirming the account here given by both names, since when it appeared above the waters it became evident, having been formerly invisible and unseen. And in addition to these arguments they adduce the facts, that many great and deep bays and gulfs of vast seas have been dried up, and have become land, and have so turned out no insignificant addition to the adjacent country, when sown and planted, and on that soil there is still left plenty of proof of such spots having formerly been sea, in the pebbles, and shells, and other things which are commonly washed up on the seashore being found in them. But if the sea is gradually being diminished then the earth also will be diminished. And in long revolutions of years every one of the elements will be entirely consumed and destroyed, and the whole air will be consumed, being diminished by little and little, and all things will be absorbed and dissolved into the one substance of fire. And for the purpose of establishing the third alternative of this question they use the following argument, beyond all question that thing has destroyed all the parts of which are liable to destruction, but all the parts of the world are liable to destruction, therefore the world also is liable to destruction. But we must now proceed to consider the question which we postpone till the present time. What sort of a part of the earth is that, that we may begin from this, whether it is greater or less, that is not dissolved by time. Do not the very hardest and strongest stones become hard, and decayed through the weakness of their conformation, and this conformation is a sort of course of a highly strained spirit, a bond not indissoluble, but only very difficult to unloose, in consequence of which they are broken up and made fluid, so that they are dissolved first of all into a thin dust, and afterwards are wholly wasted away and destroyed, Again, if the water were never agitated by the winds, but were left immovable forever, would it not from inaction and tranquility become dead? At all events it is changed by such stagnation, and becomes very fetid and foul-smelling, like an animal deprived of life. And so also the corruptions of the air are plain to everyone, for it is the nature of the atmosphere to become sick 
and to decay, and, as one may say, in a manner to die, since what else is it which a man, who is not aiming at selecting plausible language, but only at truth, would call a plague except to death of the atmosphere, which diffuses its own disease, and suffering to the destruction of everything which is endowed with life. And why need I speak at great length concerning fire? For if it is deprived of nourishment it is immediately extinguished. If then, each of the separate parts of the world awaits utter destruction, it is plain that the world which is compounded of these cannot be itself exempt from destruction. We must now consider with accuracy the fourth and remaining argument. Thus they argue. If the world were eternal then the animals also would be eternal, and much more the human race, in proportion, as that is more excellent than the other animals, but, on the contrary, those who take delight in investigating the mysteries of nature consider that man has only been created in the late ages of the world, for it is likely, or I should rather say it is inevitably true, that the arts coexist with man, so, as to be exactly coeval, with him, not only because methodical proceedings are appropriate to a rational nature, but also, because it is not possible to live without them, let us therefore examine the dates of each of these, disregarding the fables invented by the tragedians about the gods, but if man is not eternal then, neither is any other animal, so that then neither are the places which receive them, the earth, or the water, or the air, from all which considerations it is plain that this world is liable to destruction. But it is necessary to encounter such quibbling arguments, as these, lest some persons of too little experience should yield to, and be led away by them, and we must begin our refutation of them from the same point from which the sophists begin their deceit. They say, there could no longer be any inequalities existing on the earth, if the world were eternal. Why not, my most excellent friends? For other persons will come up and say that the natures of trees are in no respect different from mountains, but just as they at certain seasons lose their leaves, and again at certain seasons recover their verdure again, on which account there is admirable truth in those lines of the poet Ash like leaves on trees the race of man is found, now green in youth, now withering on the ground, another race the following spring supplies, they fall successive and successive rise. And so in like manner some portions of the mountains are broken off, and others grow in their stead, but after a long lapse of time the additional growth becomes conspicuous, because the trees having a more rapid nature display their increase with great rapidity, but mountains have a slower character, on which account it happens that the additions which take place in their case are not perceptible by the outward senses except after a long time. And these men appear to be ignorant of the manner in which they are produced, since if they had not been, perhaps they would have been silent out of shame. But still there is no reason why we should not teach them, but there is nothing new in what is now said, neither are they our words, but the ancient sayings of wise men, by whom nothing which was necessary for knowledge has been left uninvestigated, when the fiery principle which is contained beneath, in the earth, is thrust upwards by the natural power of fire. It proceeds to its own appropriate place, and if it meets with any respite or relaxation, though ever so slight, it draws up with it a large portion of the earthy substance, as much as it can, and when it has emerged from the earth it proceeds more slowly, but the earthy substance being compelled to follow it for a long time, being at last raised to animus height, is contracted at the top and at last comes to end on a sharp point imitating the general appearance of the flame of fire. 4. There arises then a most violent contention between two things which are natural adversaries, the lightest and the heaviest of things, each of them pressing on words to reach its own place, and each striving against the violent efforts of the other. Accordingly the fire, which is drawing up the earth with it, is compelled to sink down by its descending power, and the earth naturally inclining to the lowest point is nevertheless to a certain degree made light, and lifted up by the upward tendencies of fire. And so is raised on high, and being at last overpowered by the more influential power which lightens it is thrust upwards towards the natural seat of fire, and established on high. 
Why then need we wonder if the mountains are not entirely washed away by the impetuosity of the rains, when so great a power, which keeps them together, and by which they are raised up, is very firmly, and steadfastly connected with them? For if they were released from the bond which holds them together, it would be natural for them to be entirely dissolved, and to be dispersed by the water, but since they are bound together by this power of fire, they resist the impetuosity of the rains more surely. These things, then, may be said by us with respect to the argument, that the inequalities of the surface of the earth are no proof of the world having been created, and being liable to destruction, but with respect to that argument which was endeavored to be established by the diminution of the sea, we may reasonably adduce this statement in opposition to it. Do not look only at the islands which have risen up out of the sea, nor at any portions of land which, having been formerly buried by the waters, have in subsequent times become dry land, for obstinate contention is very unfavorable to the consideration of natural philosophy, which considers the search after truth to be the chief object of rational desire. But look rather at the contrary effects, consider how many districts on the mainland, not only such as were near the coast, but even such as were completely inland, have been swallowed up by the waters. And consider how great a portion of land has become sea, and is now sailed over by innumerable ships. Are you ignorant of the celebrated account which is given of that most sacred Sicilian strait, which in old times joined Sicily to the continent of Italy? And were vast seas on each side being excited by violent storms met together? Coming from opposite directions, the land between them was overwhelmed and broken away, from which circumstance the city built in the neighborhood was called Regium, and the result was quite different from what anyone would have expected, for the seas which had formerly been separated now flowed together, and were united in one expanse, and the land which had previously united was now separated into two portions by the strait which intersected it. In consequence of which Sicily, which had previously formed a part of the mainland, was now compelled to be an island. 21. And it is said that many other cities also have disappeared, having been swallowed up by the sea which overwhelmed them, since they speak of three in Peloponnesus, Agora, and Fairburas walls, and Helica's lofty halls, and many a once renowned town, with wreck and seaweed overgrown as having been formerly prosperous, but now overwhelmed by the violent influx of the sea. And the island of Atalates which was greater than Africa and Asia, as Plato says in the Timaeus, in one day and night was overwhelmed beneath the sea in consequence of an extraordinary earthquake and inundation, and suddenly disappeared, becoming sea, not indeed navigable, but full of gulfs and eddies. Therefore that imaginary, and fictitious diminution of the sea has no connection with the destruction or durability of the world, for in fact it appears to recede indeed from some parts, but to rise higher in others, and it would have been proper rather not to look at only one of these results, but at both together, and so to form one's opinion, since in all the disputed questions which arise in human life, a wise and honest judge will not deliver his opinion before he has heard the arguments of the advocates on both sides. And as for the third argument, it is convicted by itself, as being derived only from an unsound system, of questioning proceeding from the assertions originally made, for in truth it does not necessarily follow that a thing, all the parts of which are liable to corruption, is likewise perishable itself but this is only inevitably true of that thing of which all the parts are perishable when taken collectively, and together in the same place, and at the same time. Since in the case of a person who has the tip of his finger cut off, he is not disabled from living, but if he had the whole collection of all his parts and limbs cut off at once, he would die immediately. Therefore in the same manner, if all the elements of the world together were all to disappear at one and the same moment, then it would be necessary to admit that the world was liable to corruption and destruction. But if each of these elements separately only changes its nature, so as to assimilate to that of its nature, it is then rendered immortal rather than destroyed, according to the philosophical statement of the tragic poet, not, that has once existed dies, 
though often what has been combined before. We separated find, invested with another form. For it is the greatest folly imaginable to estimate the antiquity of the human race from the state of art, for if any one were to follow the absurdity of such a system of reasoning, as this, he will prove the world to be very young indeed, and to have been made scarcely a thousand years, since all those men whom we have heard of traditionally as the discoverers in different branches of science do not go back to a greater number of years, and that which I have mentioned. But if we must speak of the arts as coeval with the race of mankind, then we must speak, drawing our arguments from natural history, and not inconsiderately or carelessly. And what is this history? The destruction of the things on the earth, not altogether, but of the greatest number of them, is attributed to two principal causes, the indescribable violence, and power of fire and water. And they say, that each of these elements attacks them in its turn, after very long periods of revolving years. When, therefore, a conflagration seizes upon things, a stream of ethereal fire being poured down from above is frequently diffused over them, overrunning many districts of the habitable world, and when a deluge draws down the whole of the rainy nature of water, the regular rivers and torrents overflowing, and not only that, but even far exceeding the ordinary measure of a common flood. Accordingly, when the greater part of mankind is destroyed in the manners, above mentioned, Besides an infinity of other ways of less power and importance, it follows of necessity that the arts also must fail, for it cannot be possible to discuss science by itself without someone to reduce it to method and practice. But when those common pestilences relax their fury, and when the human race begins again to recover vigor, and to flourish, descending from those who have not been previously destroyed by the evils which pressed upon them, then the arts also begin again to exist, not indeed as they were at first, but in thinner numbers from the diminution of the numbers of those who practice them. I have now then set forth to the best of my ability what I have been able to learn or to understand concerning the indestructibility of the world, and shalt beget nations, that is to say, each individual among thy sons shall be the founder of a nation. But the second is of this kind. Like a father you shall be clothed with power over, and authority to rule, many nations, for a lover of God is necessarily, and at once also a lover of men, so that he will diligently devote his attention, not only to his relations, but also to all mankind, and especially to those who are able to go through the discipline of strict attention, and who are of a disposition the reverse of anything cruel or hard, but of one which easily submits to virtue, and willingly gives obedience to right reason. But the third we may explain under this allegory, the multitude of nations spoken of indicates as it were the multifarious inclination of the will in each of our minds, both those inclinations which it is accustomed to form with reference to itself, and also those others which it admits by the agency of the senses, as they enter clandestinely through the intervention of the imagination, and if the mind possesses the supreme authority over all these, it, like a common father, turns them to better objects. Cherishing their infant opinions, as it were, with milk, exhorting those which are older and more mature, though still imperfect, to improvement, and honoring with commendation those which perform their duty aright, and again, putting a bridle, by means of discipline and reproof, on those which rebel, and act rashly, since, wishing to imitate the deity, it receives a twofold influx from the virtues of that same being, one from his beneficent attributes, and another from his avenging might, as if from two sources, therefore the docile receive his kindness. And towards the rebellious he uses reproof, so that some are led to improvement, by praise and others by chastisement, in truth, he, who is eminent for virtue is able to be of great and extensive and just service to all, according to his power. What is the meaning of thy name shall not be called Abram, but Abraham shall thy name be? Some of those who are destitute of all knowledge of music and dancing, some indeed being wholly foolish and keeping aloof from the divine company, mock the one existing or only wise being, immaculate by nature, saying, 
in a tone of vituperation, O oh, the great gift, the governor, and lord, of the whole universe has given one letter, by which the name of the patriarch was to be increased and become of great importance, so, as to be made a trisyllable instead of a disyllable. O oh, the great misery, and wickedness, and impiety, of such men! If some persons dare, in any respect, to endeavor to detract from God, being deceived by the outward appearance of a name, when they ought rather to thrust their minds down into the depths, and inquire into the things themselves more closely, on account of the real magnitude and importance of the possession. Besides this, why do ye not think the concession of one letter, although a small and easy gift, nevertheless an act of providence? And why do ye not weigh its value? Since, above all things, the very first element of language, as expressed in letters, is a, both in order, and in virtue. In the second place, it is also a vowel, and the very first of vowels, being placed above them as their head. In the third place, because it does not belong to long properties, nor to short properties, but it is of the number of those which comprise each characteristic, for it is extended into greater length, and then again it is recalled into shortness, by reason of its softness, resembling wax, and being figured into many shapes, and afterwards figuring words, according to infinite numbers. Besides all this it is a cause, for it is the brother of unity, from which all things begin, and in which all things terminate. Therefore, when any one sees such great be, and a letter set forth with such great importance and necessity, how can he accuse it, as if he had not seen this? For if he has seen it, he then shows himself to be a person of insulting disposition, and a hater of what is good, and if he has not seen a fact, which is so easy to comprehend, how does he presume to ridicule and despise that which he does not understand, as if he did understand it? But however these things may be said by the way, as I stated before, but we must now examine into its necessary and most important task. The addition of the letter A, by one single element, changed and reformed the whole character of the mind, causing it, instead of the sublime knowledge and learning of sublime things, that is to say, instead of astronomy, to acquire a comprehension of wisdom, since it is by the knowledge of things above that the faculty is acquired of mounting up to one portion of the world, that is to say, to heaven and to the periodical revolutions and motions of the stars. But wisdom has reference to the nature of all things, both such as are visible to the outward senses, and such as are appreciable only by the intellect, for the intellect is the wisdom which gives a knowledge of divine and human things, and of their principles. Therefore, in divine things there is something which is visible, and something else which is invisible, and a demonstrative idea. And in human affairs there are some things which are corporeal, and some which are incorporeal, to obtain to the right comprehension of which is a great task, and a real employment for the abilities and courage of man. But to be able, not only to behold the substances and natures of the universe, but also the principles which regulate each separate fact, indicates a virtue more perfect than that which is allotted to mankind, for it is necessary for the mind, which perceives so many and such great things, to be altogether, and holy eye, and to dispense with sleep, passing its whole existence, in the world in a state of incessant wakefulness, and being surrounded by a light which knows no darkness, and which exhibits the appearance of light itself, as by an ever-flashing lightning, taking God, for its leader and guide, to the comprehension of the knowledge of those things which are and to the faculty of explaining their principles. Therefore the disyllabic name Abram is explained as meaning excellent father, on account of his affinity to the knowledge of sublime wisdom, that is, astronomy and mathematics. But the trisyllabic name Abraham is interpreted the father of elect sound, being the name of really wise man, for what else is sound in us, except the utterance of a pronounced word? for which object we have an instrument constructed by nature, passing through the thick tube of the throat, and united with the mouth and tongue, and the father of such a sound is our intellect, and elect intellect is endued with virtue. 
But if we are to keep to exact propriety, then it is plain that the mind is the familiar and natural father of the uttered word, because it is the especial property of the father to beget, and the word is born from the mind, and it will be a certain proof of this if we recollect that when it is set in motion by counsels it sounds, and when they are absent it ceases to sound. And the evidences of this are the rhetoricians and philosophers, who demonstrate its habit by objects, for whenever the mind publishes abroad different heads of designs, and in the manner of a mother about to bring forth produces each individual means previously stored up in itself, then also the word, flowing forth like a fountain, is borne to the ears of the bystander, as to its appropriate receptacles. But when those are wanting, then it also is unable to publish itself further, and rests and the sound is inactive, as being struck by no one. Now therefore, O human, full and crammed with superfluous loquacity, human devoid of wisdom, does not the gift of one single element appear to you to have been such that by the intervention of a single letter the wise man is rendered worthy of the divine attribute of wisdom, and which there is nothing more excellent in our nature? Because instead of the sublime erudition of astronomy he gave him intellect, that is to say, Instead of a small part of wisdom, he gave him the whole and perfect blessing of entire wisdom, since knowledge of things above is included and comprehended in wisdom, as a part is included in the whole, for mathematics are only a part. But it becomes you, omen, to consider this point also, that the man, who is well instructed, and skillful in the investigation of the nature of things, above may by possibility be a man of depraved and wicked habits, but the wise man is altogether approved, as virtuous. Shall we then now any longer ridicule this gift, and which nothing more excellent can be found? For what is more shameful than wickedness, or more excellent than virtue? Can anything be found here not good, and is it not wholly opposed to evil? Or can this gift be compared to riches, or honor, or liberty, or health? or to any other superfluous possession of any kind around or exterior to the body? For the whole of philosophy is thus added to our life, as a sort of college of medicine, to the soul, in order from thence to dispense to it freedom from suffering and immunity from disease, but in truth it is noble to be a philosopher, and that wonderful knowledge is truly noble and the end is even more admirable, on account of which the act is called into existence. Here therefore is wisdom, and that the best kind of wisdom, which God called in the Chaldaic dialect Abraham, namely the father of elect sound, giving, as it were a definition of a wise man, for, as the definition of man is a mortal animal endowed with reason, so also the mysterious definition of a wise man is the father of elect sound, what is the meaning of, I will greatly increase thee, and set thee among the nations, and kings shall proceed from thee? That expression, I will greatly increase thee, was used to the wise man, with exceeding propriety, since every wicked or bad man does increase and advance, not to improvement, but towards deficiency, as withering flowers advance not towards life, but towards death, but the man, whose life is extended long and is greatly increased is like a passing cloud, or like the continually flowing stream of a river, because, as it increases it is extended more and more out of doors, as its wisdom also is divine. And that expression, I will set thee among the nations, was used in order, that God might the more evidently demonstrate that he was making him worthy to be as a foundation, and firm support to the nations through his wisdom, not only to his own nation, but also to all other peoples who in various manners are in want in respect of their minds, as has been said before, since the wise man is the redeemer of nations and intercessor for them before God. And since it is he who implores pardon for the sins of his relations. Last of all, the promise, kings shall come forth from thee, is again used with especial propriety, for everything which relates to wisdom is a royal seed, the offspring of the chief and master according to nature, but the wise man has no seed or fruit of his own, but is fertile and abundant in the seed which proceeds from the great cause himself. What is the meaning of, I will give this land to thee, and to thy seed, after thee, in which thou hast sojourned, namely all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession? 
The letter of the promise is so clear that the language does not stand in need of any explanation whatever, but with respect to the inward meaning of it we must have recourse to an allegory of this kind. The mind which is endowed with virtue is rather a sojourner in the corporeal space allotted to it, an a regular inhabitant of it, for its real country is the air, and the heaven, and the earth, and the earthly body, in which it is said to sojourn, is only a colony, therefore the father conferring a benefit upon it, gives to it the sovereign authority over all the things of the earth forever, and ever, as he says himself, for an everlasting possession. So that it for the future shall not be governed by the body, but shall always be its master and ruler, having the body for its servant and attendant. What is the meaning of, and every male of you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise, or you shall be circumcised, in, the flesh of your foreskin. I see here a twofold circumcision, one of the male creature, and the other of the flesh, that which is of the flesh takes place, in the genitals, but that which is of the male creature takes place, as it seems to me, in respect of his thoughts. Since that which is, properly speaking, Masculine in us is the intellect, the superfluous shoots of which it is necessary to prune away, and to cast off, so that it, becoming clean and pure from all wickedness, and vile, may worship God, as his priest. This therefore is what is designated by the second circumcision, where God says by an express law, circumcise the hardness of your hearts, that is to say, your heart and rebellious thoughts and ambition, which when they are cut away, and removed from you, your most important part will be rendered free. Why orders he the males only to be circumcised? For in the first place, the Egyptians, in accordance with the national customs of their country, in the fourteenth year of their age, when the male begins to have the power of propagating his species, and when the female arrives at the age of puberty, circumcise both bride and bridegroom. But the divine legislator appoints circumcision to take place in the case of the male alone for many reasons, the first of which is that the male creature feels venereal pleasures and desires matrimonial connections more than the female, on which account the female is properly omitted here, while he checks the superfluous impetuosity of the male by the sign of circumcision. But the second reason is, that the material of the female is supplied to the sun from what remains over of the eruption of blood, while the immediate maker and cause of the sun is the male. Because therefore the male supplies the most indispensable part in the fact of generation, God deservedly represses his pride by the figure of circumcision, but the material or feminine cause, as being inactive, does not display ambition, in the same degree and this is enough to say on his head. But afterwards we must note this likewise, that the intellect in us is endued with the power of sight, therefore it is necessary to cut away its superfluous shoots. And these superfluous shoots are empty opinions, and all the actions which are done in accordance with them. So that the intellect after circumcision may only bear about with itself what is necessary and useful, and that whatever causes pride to increase may be cut away, with which also the eyes are circumcised, as if they did not see. Why did he say, and let the child, every male child, be circumcised at eight days old? He orders the freeborn to be circumcised, which, in the first place, was permitted on account of diseases that might arise, for it is more difficult to heal a disease in the genitals, and it is commonly done by burning by fire those parts over which a membrane grows, but this rarely affects those who have been circumcised. And in truth, if it were possible that other infirmities also could be avoided by amputating any member, or any part of the body, so that though it was amputated still the operation of each necessary part would not be hindered, then without the knowledge of mortal man he would be transmitted into immortality. But that here it was thought fit that man should be circumcised out of a provident care for his mind, without any previous infirmity is plain, since not the Jews alone, but also the Egyptians, and Arabians, and Ethiopians, and nearly all the nations who live in the southern parts of the world, down to the torrid zone are circumcised. What then is the chief reason of this fact? Except that in those districts, and especially in the summer, when the genitals are protected with the skin, it burns, 
and is injured by inflammation, but when that covering is laid bare by circumcision it is cooled, and the disease is repelled, and on this account the northern nations and others, to whom the cooler portion of the habitable earth has been allotted, are not circumcised, for not only is the solar heat moderate in those regions, but so is also all inflammatory disease which affects the membranes of the members. Let every one take a firm judgment, and from that time, when the disease comes in more vigorously, for it never comes at all in the winter, but in the summer it shows itself, and flourishes, and ripens, for it loves, if I may so say, like fire to burn in those parts. In the second place, it was not only from a regard to sound health, that our ancestors diligently employed this method of cure, but also from a regard to the multiplication of the human race, seeing that nature was very vivacious and too eager to propagate the human species. Therefore they knew, like wise men, how the seed, when poured over the folds of the membrane is often accustomed to be wasted, and so to become unfruitful, but if no impediment arises then it would easily be able to arrive at the situation suited to receive it, on which account also those nations which adopt the practice of circumcision have grown into an exceedingly numerous population, and our legislator, weighing the consequences also, commanded the circumcision of infants to be performed at an earlier age, keeping in view the same effect of circumcision with regard to the population. Therefore it is in truth, as it seems to me, that the Egyptians also in the fourteenth year of their children's age, in which the desire to propagate the species usually begins, have said that it is suitable to circumcise them, with the view of increasing the population, but it was better and more carefully done in our nation, where the circumcision of infants was ordained, since perhaps the man, when grown up would delay the operation out of fear because he then has a will of his own. In the third place, he says this with a view to cleanliness and the sacred oblations, for in truth those who enter into the courts of the temples are made clean by sprinkling and ablutions. Moreover the Egyptians scrape the whole body, removing all the hairs which cover, and envelop the body, so, as to appear white all over, but the circumcision of the skin is no small assistance towards cleanliness, otherwise every one would abhor it when he beheld it, as it is in itself. In the fourth place, there are in us two generative principles, one in the soul, and one in the body, the generative principle of the soul as the intellect, and that of the body as the corporeal organ, therefore the ancients chose to refer the generative principle of the body to an imitation of the intellect which is rather the generative principle of the heart. And in truth there is nothing to which it is found more like than the circumcision of the heart. These therefore are real facts, like the celebrated reasons for things which have been investigated. But we must now speak of those which have greater symbols belonging to them, and which exhibit a certain principle. Therefore the circumcision of the skin is said to be a symbol, but, as one indicating that it is proper to cut away all superfluous and extravagant desires, by study in continence and religion, for, as the skin of the prepuce is quite superfluous for generation, and is moreover especially injurious by reason of the disease of inflammation which burns within it, so also an overabundance of desire is as superfluous, as it is pernicious, superfluous, because it is not necessary, and pernicious, because it is the cause of diseases to both body and soul, and by the greater desire he also warns us that all the other desires are likewise to be cut off. And that is called the greater desire which has a regard to the matrimonial connection of the male and the female, since it is the beginning of a great thing, namely, of generation, and since it creates a great affection on the part of the father towards her, who is to bring forth, for it is natural, for them both to be influenced by love and affection for their offspring. Therefore, he here warns us to cut away not only all the superfluous desires, but also pride, as being a great wickedness, and an associate of wickedness. For pride, as the language of the ancients tells us, is what keeps men back, and hinders them in their improvement, since it will not exhibit that honesty which it really possesses, thinking that it is itself an adequate cause for anything. Moreover it naturally influences those who think themselves the causes of generation, 
so that they scarcely ever turn their minds at all to behold the true Father of the universe. For he is in truth the one real and genuine Father of all, and we, who are called fathers, are only instruments of his serving the generation, since, as in a wonderful resemblance, all things which are represented in appearance are yet in reality inanimate, but that which strengthens the nerves is invisible, and yet is itself the cause of virtue, and of motion, and of sight. So, in like manner, from everlasting and invisible space there extends the Creator, of the universe, and we, like so many puppets, are strengthened by Him with nerves. For the purpose which belongs to us, namely, sowing seed, and raising a generation, unless we choose to fancy that a flute is blown by itself, and is not made by an artist in a way adapted for the production of harmony, by whom it was constructed, as an instrument for service, and for its own necessary end. Why does he order circumcision to be performed on the eighth day? The number eight has many biddies in it, for it is, in the first place, a cubic number. Secondly, it has biddies, because it everywhere contains in itself the form of equality, because longitude, and breadth, and depth, which are all equal to one another, are indicated by the first number eight. In the third place, the composition of the number eight produces agreement, namely, the number thirty-six, which the Pythagoreans call agreement, since that is the first number, in which odd numbers being added together agree with even numbers. If, indeed, four odd numbers from the unit are separately taken and added together, and for even numbers beginning with two, they united make thirty-six. Now the odd numbers are these, one, three, five, seven, which make sixteen. And the even numbers are these, two, four, six, eight, which make twenty. And the addition of the two together makes thirty-six, which is in truth a more fertile number. Since it is a square, having each side composed of the number six, the first of which is both odd and even, which some persons most correctly call harmony or matrimony, and it was by the employment of this number, that the Creator, of the universe made the world, as the holy and admirable book of Moses relates. In the fourth place, the idea of eight produces sixty-four, which is the first number, which is a cube, and also a square, being the type of incorporeal substance appreciable only by the intellect, and invisible, and also of corporeal substance. Of incorporeal substance, inasmuch, as it produces superficies according to the square and of corporeal substance, as producing a solid according to the cube. In the fifth place, it is always a kindred number to the virgin number seven, for seven makes up the parts of eight, because four is the half of it, two is the fourth part of it, one the eighth of it, and four, two, and one, added together, make seven. In the sixth place, the power of eight is sixty-four, which we call the first number, being both a cube and a square. In the seventh place, taken separately from the units by these doubled numbers, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, the sum makes 64. And the number 8 has also other more distinguished virtues still, which we have enumerated in another place, but now it seems better to explain the principle which corresponds to the present question, and which depends on the grounds now laid down. But in the first place we must premise this, that nation to whom it is enjoined, having the commandments give to it, that it should be circumcised on the eighth day, is called in the Chaldaic language Israel, that is to say, he that seeth by day. Therefore God wills, in the first place, that he should be a partaker both of his own just rights, and also of those which exist according to election, and according to the principle of Genesis, or creation by that first number six, which immediately followed the creation. This number, in fact, the Father and Creator, of all things evidently exhibited to the world, as the festival of generation, completing the world on the sixth day. And the other number, that which is according to election, he exhibited by the number eight, which is the beginning of the second seven, as eight is seven and one, so the race which has been honored is always a race receiving that number also in addition, so that it should be elect, both by nature, and in accordance with the decree of the Father. In the second place, the number eight exhibits equality everywhere, 
showing that all its separations are equal, as has been already said, I mean its length, and breadth, and depth. And equality it is which is the parent of equity and justice, by which he shows that the nation which loves God is adorned with equity or justice, and has advanced to complete possession. In the third place, it is not only a measure of complete equity, in all its dimensions, but is the very first number, that is so, for it is the first cube since the number eight indicates equality, and so it has the second and not the first rank, therefore it demonstrates in a symbolical manner, that that nature was the first which was ever completely furnished with consummate and perfect equity and justice, and that it is the first nature of the human race. Not in point of creation or of time, but in the dignity of virtue, as if justice united with equality were a connatural part of it. In the fourth place, since there are four elements, the appearances of earth, water, air, and fire. Fire has received for its figure a shape becoming a similar name, a pyramid, and air has received for its figure an eight-sided one, water, a twenty-sided one, and the earth, a cube. Therefore he thought it necessary that the earth, which was to be the allotment of the race of man, who were endowed with virtue, should participate in the cubic number, as the whole earth has been formed in its figure, and a part of it receives the parts of that which should bring forth, because by nature the earth is very fertile, producing all the various and distinct species of every kind of animal and plant. Why does he order all slaves to be circumcised, those born in the family, and also those who are bought? The literal meaning is plain, for it is fitting that servants should imitate their masters on account of their necessary employment, and the services to which they are bound in life. But with respect to the inner object of the command, those dispositions are what may be called born in the family which are influenced by nature itself, and those are bought which can be changed for the better by teaching and instruction. Each of these has its appropriate employment, and requires like a plant to be cleared and pruned in order, that the good and fruitful parts may acquire constancy, for fertile plants produce many superfluous things by reason of their fecundity and those superfluities must be cut away, but those who are taught by instructors cut away their ignorance. What is the meaning of, and it shall be my covenant, or agreement, in your flesh? God is willing to do good, not only to the man, who is endued with virtue, but he wishes that the divine word should regulate not only his soul, but his body also, as if it had become its physician. And it must be its care, to prune away all excesses, of seeing, and hearing, and taste, and smell, and touch, and also those of the instrument of voice and articulation, and also all the redundant and pernicious impulses of the genitals, as also of the whole body, the effect of which is, that at times we are delighted by our passions, and at times pained by them. Why is it that he pronounces a sentence of death on an infant, saying, every male child, who is not circumcised, who has not been circumcised, or, as the Greek has it, who shall not be circumcised, in the flesh of his foreskin on the eighth day, that soul shall be cut off from his generation. The law never declares a man guilty for any unintentional offense, since even those who have committed an unintentional homicide are pardoned by it, cities being set apart into which such men may flee, and their fine security or whoever escapes to them is rendered secure and free from danger, and no one has the power to drag him forth, or to cite him before the tribunal of the judge for the deed. Therefore, if a boy is not circumcised on the eighth day, after his birth, what offense will he have committed that he is to be held guilty, and suffer the penalty of death? Some persons may perhaps say that the form of the command points to the parents themselves, for they look upon them as despisers of the command of the law. But others say that it has here exerted excessive severity against infants, as it seems, imposing this heavy penalty in order, that grown-up persons who break the law may thus be irrevocably subjected to most severe punishment. This is the literal effect of the words. But if we look to their inward meaning, then what is male in us is most especially the intellect, and that God here commands to be circumcised on the eighth day, 
for the reason previously stated, not in any other part, but in the flesh of the foreskin, by this expression symbolically indicating those parts which in the flesh do subsequently become the organs of pleasure and impulse. And on this account it is that he introduces a legitimate reason, warning men, that the intellect, which is not circumcised, and cleared away from the flesh, and the vices of the flesh, is corrupt, and cannot be saved. But that this language is not to be applied to the man, but to the intellect, which is thus put in a sound condition, he tells us in the subsequent words, saying, that soul shall be cut off, not that human body, or that man, but that soul and mind. Cut off from what? From its generation, for the whole generation is incorrupt. Therefore the wicked man is removed from incorruption to corruption. Why does God say, Sarah thy wife shall not be called Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name? Here again some foolish persons may laugh at the addition of one single letter, that is to say, of a hundred, for in Greek characters the letter R means a hundred, but if they jest in this way they are foolish, as being unwilling to behold the inward merits of things, and to cleave to the footsteps of truth, for that element, R, which is here thought of merely as the addition of one letter is the parent of all harmony, making things great instead of small, general instead of particular, and mortal instead of immortal, since Sarah, when called Sarah, with one R, is interpreted by princedom, but with two R's, Sarah, princess. Let us then be careful, and see how these two names are distinguished from one another. In me wisdom, or prudence, integrity, or temperance, Justice and fortitude have only a prince, like power, and are mortal, moreover. When I die they die too. But this wisdom is herself a princess, and justice is a prince too, and each separate one of these virtues is not the principal or princely part, in me, but is itself a mistress, and a queen, an everlasting monarchy and sovereignty. Do you not now see the magnitude of the gift? By this slight change, God changes the part into the whole the species into the genus, the corruptible into the incorruptible. And all these things are previously dispensed on account of the impending birth of a more perfect joy, and all joys, whose name is Isaac. Why does he say, and from her I will give thee children, and I will bless him, and he shall be over the nations, and kings of the nations shall come forth from him? It is scarcely proper to inquire why he has said children in the plural number when he meant their only and beloved son, for the intention of God's words applies to his offspring, from which nations and kings should arise. This is the literal meaning of the words. But if we look to their more inward sense, when the soul possesses that virtue, small and mortal, as it is, which is only particular, she is still barren. But from the time that it acquires a share of the divine and incorruptible virtue, it begins to conceive and to bring forth varieties of nations, namely, of all other holy and sacred persons, for every one of the everlasting virtues is subject to an immense number of voluntary laws, which bear in themselves a similarity to nations and kingdoms, for virtue, and the generations of virtue are royal things, being previously instructed by nature what it is which rejoices in princely power, and has no knowledge of a servile condition. Why did Abraham fall on his face and laugh? Two things are indicated by his falling on his face. One an act of adoration on account of the excess of his divine ecstasy, the other that it corresponds to, and is suitable to the aforesaid harmony, by which the intellect has confessed that God alone exists in a continual and unvarying existence. But those creatures which owe their existence to creation and generation, all are subject to changes in time, for they fall to a certain extent, inasmuch as they are accustomed to rise up and to be corrected in accordance with their original appearance. And it was very natural for Abraham to laugh at the promise, as he was then filled with the great hope that the things which he expected should be accomplished, especially because he had received a manifest revelation from that appearance by which he became more thoroughly acquainted with him, who exists for everlasting without variation, and with him also who is continually stooping, and falling. Why did Abraham appear to hesitate about the promise, 
for the sacred writer says, he said in his mind, shall there be a son to one, who is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bring forth a child. This expression, he said in his mind, is not added without an object, or gratuitously, for words which are articulated in the tongue, and the mouth incur guilt, and become liable to punishment, but those which are restrained within the mind are not liable to punishment, because the mind, without any intention on its part is led away by irregularities, all kinds of passions being introduced from different quarters, which it for a while resists, being indignant at them, and wishing to keep aloof from their representations. But perhaps we should not say that he hesitated, but rather that he was struck by wonderment at the amazing nature of the gift, and so said, Behold my body is advanced in years, and has passed the age of generation, nevertheless all things are possible to God, so that he may transmute old age into youth, and lead those who have no seed nor fruit to fertility and generation, and if a man, who is a hundred years, and a woman, who is ninety years old become parents. All commonplace occurrences, and all regularity of nature will be done away, and it will be clearly seen that it is only the power, and the grace of God. But what virtue the number one hundred has must now be explained. In the first place, a hundred is the power of the number ten. In the second place, the number ten thousand is the power of this number a hundred, and ten thousand is the brother of the unit, for as one times one is one, so ten thousand times one is ten thousand. In the third place, every part of the number a hundred is honorable. In the fourth place, this number consists of thirty-six and sixty-four, which is a cube, and at the same time a triangle. In the fifth place, it is composed of all these separate odd numbers, one, three, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19, which added together make the hundred. In the sixth place, it is composed of these four numbers, one and its double, and four and its double, as one, two, four, eight, which make fifteen, and of these four numbers also added together, one, four, fifteen, sixty-four, which make eighty-five. And the principle of doubling pervades all these numbers, containing that principle which is by fours, and by fives, and the principle of four times, and twice pervades them all. In the seventh place, it is composed of five numbers taken simply, one, two, three, four, which make ten, and of five triangular numbers, one, three, six, ten, which make twenty, and of five quadrangular numbers, one, four, nine. 16, which make 30, and of 5 quinquangular numbers, 1, 5, 12, 22, which make 40, and all these added together make a 100. In the 8th place, it is composed of 4 cubes taken simply beginning with the unit, for after giving 1, 2, 3, 4, their cubes 1, 8, 27, 64, make a 100. In the 9th place, it is divided into 40 and 60 each of which is a very natural number, and in accordance with the first order of decimals up to 10,000, in a quinquangular figure the number a hundred holds the middle place, for instance, one, ten, a hundred, one thousand, ten thousand, where a hundred is the middle number of one, ten, a hundred, one thousand, and ten thousand. But we ought also not to pass over in silence the number ninety as far as it concerns the visible characters, as it seems to me the number 90 is second only to the number 100, inasmuch as the tenth part of it, that is to say 10, is taken away, since I see that in the law two tenths of the first fruits were set apart, first a tenth of the whole, secondly a tenth of the remainder, for one a tenth of the fruits of the earth, of corn, or wine, or oil, is taken, another tenth is also taken from the remainder. Therefore of these two that which is the first and principal one is honored with the greater share, and in the second place that which follows it, since the number a hundred of the years of the wise man comprises both the first fruits with which it is consecrated, both the first and the second kind, but the number ninety of the years of the female parent, comprehends the second and lesser first fruits, namely, the remainder of the first, which is the great one among the sacred numbers. 
this therefore may be called the first vision in the sacred law which is familiar, and the other has a general character, for the number ninety is fertile, on which account also it happens that the woman begins to bring forth in the ninth month, but the tenth is the sacred and perfect number, and when the two numbers nine, and ten are multiplied together ninety is made, as being the virtue of the sacred birth, receiving a fertile generation according to the number nine, and a holy one according to ten. Why did Abraham say to God, O oh, may this my son Ishmael live before thee? In the first place, I do not despair, says he, O oh Lord, of a better generation, but I believe by promise. Nevertheless, it would be a sufficient blessing for me for this son to live to in the meantime as a living son, standing visibly, even though he be not so according to the legitimate blood, but is only born of a concubine. In the second place, that blessing which he is now asking for is an additional one, for he does not entreat for life alone for his sons, but for an especial life in God. And we must suppose that there is nothing more perfect than the rejoicing in the presence of God, with a salutary soundness of mind, which is equal to immortality. In the third place, he by a conjecture intimates that the divine law, when heard, ought not to be considered enough if merely heard, but that it ought also to enter more deeply into the inward man, and to form his principal part, for that life is worthy of being beheld by the deity which is formed in accordance with his word. Why does the divine oracle, in the way of intimation, say to Abraham, Yes, be it so, behold Sarah thy wife shall also bring forth a son unto thee, the meaning of the sentence is as follows, that confession and admission, says God, is on my part an admission of my wish, being manifestly full of unadulterated joy, and your faith is not doubtful, but without any hesitation it has a share of modesty and reverence, therefore that which thou hast received before, as to be done unto thee on account of thy faith, in me, shall certainly be done, for this is what is meant by yes. Why does he say, but behold I will also listen to thee concerning Ishmael, and I will bless him, and he shall become the father of twelve nations. God says, I will grant to thee both the first and the second blessing, that is to say, both the blessings of nature, and the blessings of instruction, by nature, that which is according to the legitimate course of nature, that is Isaac, and by instruction, that which is according to Ishmael, who is not legitimate, for hearing when compared with sight, is like the illegitimate compared with the legitimate. And what is brought about by instruction is not of the same class with that which owes its existence to nature, and the man, who is desirous of encyclical wisdom becomes the father of nations, for the encyclical number is a period of twelve days and years. Why does he say, But I will set up my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bring forth about this time, in the succeeding year? As in men's wills some persons are set down as heirs, and some are entered, as worthy of gifts which they are to receive from the heirs, so also in the divine testament that man is set down as the heir, who is by nature a worthy disciple of God being adorned with all perfect virtues, but he, who is introduced by learning, and is made subject to the law of wisdom, and partakes in encyclical instruction, is not at all an heir but only a receiver of gifts gratuitously given. But it is said with great wisdom and propriety that his mother shall bring forth Isaac in the succeeding year, since this birth unto life does not belong to the present time, but to another great and holy time, and that which is divine rejoices in excessive abundance, and is by no means like the nations of this world. Why does he say, Abraham was ninety? and nine years old when he was circumcised, and Ishmael his son was thirteen years old. The number of ninety and nine years is arranged here, as approximating to the number a hundred. And it is in accordance with this number, that it is arranged that the seed of the perfect man becomes the beginning of generation, which appears more evidently in the number a hundred, but the number thirteen is composed of the first square numbers of four and nine, the odd and even numbers so that the even number has for its sides a twofold material form, and the odd number has an operative form, from all which a triple number is made, which is the greatest and most perfect of the festival victims which the examinations of the sacred scriptures contain. This is one reason. 
a second also it may be allowed to us to mention that the age namely of 13 years is very near to and a partaker with the 14th year in which the motions of C towards generation begin to have life. In order, therefore, that no foreign seed should be sown, he arranged that the first generations should be kept pure, figuring the instrument of generating under the figure of generation. In the third place, he teaches that he who is about to go through the operations of matrimony ought by all means first of all to cut away concupiscence, reproving all lascivious and effeminate persons as those who bring together superfluous mixtures which were not for the sake of the generation of children, but to gratifying continent desires. Why did Abraham also circumcise strangers? The wise man is as useful as the humane man who saves and invites to himself not only his relations and neighbors, but also strangers and men of another family, giving them a share of his own habit of patient and religious continence, for these are the foundations of constancy, which is the object of all virtue, and the point at which it rests, as therefore God ordered fountains of water fit to drink to burst up from the earth without the cooperation of man. So he also of his own accord granted to man in a similar manner wheat and barley, in order, that he himself might be the sole giver of each kind of food which serves for necessary eating and drinking. But he did not take away the power, nor grudge them providing for themselves by their own industry those things which contribute to pleasure. What is the meaning of the statement? He drank of the wine, and was drunken. In the first place, the just man did not drink the wine, but a portion of the wine, not the whole of it, in which case an incontinent and debauched man does not quit his means of debauchery till he has first swallowed all the wine that there is before him, but by the religious and sober man everything necessary for food is used in a moderate degree. And the expression, he was drunken, is here to be taken simply as equivalent to he used the wine. But there are two modes of getting drunk. The one is that of an intemperate sottishness which misuses wine, and this offense is peculiar to the depraved and wicked man. The other is the use of wine, and this belongs to the wise. It is therefore in the second of these meanings that the consistent and wise Noah is here called drunken, not as having misused, but as having used wine. What is the meaning of the statement? He was naked in his house. This is a praise of the wise men both in the literal sense of the words and also in their hidden meaning that his exhibition of nakedness took place not out of doors but in his house, being concealed by the roof and walls of his house, for the nakedness of the body is concealed by a house which is made of stones and beams of wood, but the covering and clothing of the soul is the discipline of wisdom. Therefore there are two kinds of nakedness, one which takes place by accident which is the result of an involuntary offense because the just man, using, if I may say so, his honesty, as if it were a garment with which he is clothed, stumbles out of his own accord, like men who are intoxicated or who are afflicted with insanity, for in such men their offenses are not deliberately committed, but it is his task and pleasing duty to clothe himself, as with a garment, with the discipline and study of honesty. There is also another kind of nakedness of the soul which is caused by perfect virtue, which expels from itself the whole carnal weight of the body, as if it were flying from a tomb, as indeed it has long been buried in it, as in a tomb, as also it avoids pleasures, and also a great number of miseries arising from the different passions, and many anxieties arising from misfortunes, and indeed all the evil effects of these different circumstances. He therefore, who has been able with distinction to pass through such various and great dangers, and to escape such injuries, and to emancipate himself from such evils, has attained to the destiny of happiness, without any stain or disgrace, for I should pronounce this to be the ornament and badge of beauty in those individuals who have been rendered worthy to pass their existence in an incorporeal manner. Why is it that the secret writer has not simply said? Ham saw his nakedness, but Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father. By stating the fact thus, he both blames the son in the father, and the father in the son, as performing together in common the deed of folly and iniquity, 
and impiety, and every other kind of wickedness. This is the literal meaning of the statement. And, as to the inner sense, we must look at that in the same manner in which we have hitherto treated these subjects. What is the meaning of the statement? He told it to his two brothers, out of doors. The sacred historian is here adding to the gravity of the transaction. In the first place, because he did not report the involuntary evil of his father to one brother only, but to both of them, and no doubt, if he had had any more he would have told it to them all, as he did in fact, to every one he could, and he did so with ridicule in his very words, making a jest of what ought not to have been treated with laughter and derision, but rather with shame and fear mingled with reverence. In the second place, when the historian says he told it them, not in the house, but out of the house, he evidently points out that he displayed his father, when naked, not only to his brothers, but also to the bystanders with whom they were, both men and women. This is the literal information conveyed by the words. But if we look to their inward meaning, then we shall see that a depraved and malignant habit of life is full of derision and contempt, and it is a bad thing to judge of the miseries of others even by oneself, like a chastising judge. But in this case what has happened is worse than this, for any man with a joyful mind to ridicule the involuntary misfortune of a devoted disciple of wisdom, and to make a song of and proclaim abroad his misery, is the part of a thoroughly hostile accuser, who ought rather to have pardoned such an occurrence, than to have added accusation or vituperation to it. Moreover, because these three things are, as I have said before, as it were brothers together, namely, good, bad, and indifferent, being all the offspring of one parent thought, in accordance with each of these principles, they have been found to be overseers, some celebrating virtues with praise, others upholding acts of malignity, and others supporting riches and honors, and other good things which, however, are not attached to, and which are external to the body. The overseers who emulate wickedness rejoice at the fall of the wise man, and ridicule, and disparage him, as if he had done no good by the part which he adopts, and to which he applies himself as better for the mind, or for his body, or for his external circumstances, to his internal virtues, or to any of the good things which are around and exterior to his body. Unless indeed that man alone is eminently able to attain his object, who applies himself to iniquity, as that alone is accustomed to confer advantages on human life. Pronouncing these and similar precepts, those who are overseers of iniquity ridicule those who devote themselves to virtue, and to those things by which virtue is produced and consolidated, as some look upon those things, to be which are around the body, and outside it and which may be regarded in the light of instruments serving to that end. What is the meaning of the statement? Shem and Japhet, taking a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father, and they themselves did not see it. The literal meaning of the statement is evident, but with respect to the inner sense contained in it, we must say that the light man who is in too great haste only sees those things which are before his eyes, and exposed to his sight, but that the evil man also sees those things which are at his back, that is to say, the future. And since what is posterior is postponed to what is anterior, so is what is future to what is present, the sight of which is peculiar to the virtuous and wise man, who in truth is a second Lincius, being according to the fables gifted with eyes in every part. Therefore every wise man, who is not so much man, as actual intellect, walks backward, that is to say, he sees what is behind him or future, as if it were placed in brilliant light, and seeing everything on all sides of him with a perfect sight, and looking all around him, he is found to be armed, and protected, and fortified, so that no part of his soul is ever found naked, or in an unseemly plight, on account of any accidents which occur unfortunately. What is the meaning of the statement? And Noah became sober after the wine. The literal meaning is too notorious. Therefore we need only here speak of what concerns the inner sense of the words. When the intellect is strengthened, it is able by its soberness, to discern with a certain accuracy all things, both before and behind it, both present, I mean, 
and future, but the man who can see neither what is present nor what is future with accuracy is afflicted by blindness, but he who sees the present but who cannot also foresee the future and is not at all cautious, such a man is overcome by drunkenness and intoxication, and he, lastly, who is found to be able to look all around him, and to see, and discern, and comprehend the different natures of things, both present and future, the watchfulness of sobriety is in that man. Why is it that after the sacred historian has enumerated Ham, in the middle of the offspring of Noah, or has placed him in the middle between his brethren, he nevertheless points out that he was the younger, saying, Noah saw what his younger son had done to him. This is a manifest allegory, because he here takes as the younger, not him, who was so in age and in point of time, but him, who was younger in mind, since wickedness is unable to attain to a perception of the learning which is proper to the elder, but the elder thoughts belong to a will which is truly growing old, not indeed in body, but in mind. Why did Noah when praying for Shem speak thus, Blessed is the Lord God, the God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant? The names Lord and God are here used together on account of his principal attributes, both of benevolence and of kingly power by which the world was created, for as king he created the world according to his beneficence, but after he had completed it then the world was arranged and set in order by his attribute of kingly power. Therefore he at that time rendered the wise man worthy of a common honor, which the whole world also received, all the parts of the world being formed in an admirable manner with the attributes of the Lord and God, doing so by his especial prerogative, munificently pouring forth the favor and liberality of his beneficent power. And it is on this account that the beneficent power of God is mentioned twice. Once, as has been already stated, being placed in opposition to his kingly power, and a second time, without any such connection, in order, forsooth, that the wise man having been rendered worthy of his gifts, both such, as are common to him with others, and such, as are peculiar to himself, he might also be rendered acceptable both to the world, and to God, to the world on account of the excellence imparted to him in common with it, and to God, for such as was peculiar to himself. Why, when Noah prayed for Japhet, did he say, God shall enlarge Japhet, and bid him to dwell in the house of Shem, and Canaan shall be their servant? Without examining the literal statement, for the meaning of that is plain, we had better approach the inner sense contained in it, and examine that, in which the second and third blessings mentioned are capable of an enlarged and ample extension as, for instance, good health, and a vigorous state of the outward senses, and beauty, and strength, and opulence, and nobleness of birth, and friends, and the power of a prince, and numbers of other things. And on this account he said, God shall enlarge, etc. Because taken separately, the abundant possession of such numerous and great blessings has of itself been injurious to many persons who have scarcely dwelt with justice, or wisdom, or any other virtues, the complete possession of which dispenses to man in an admirable manner the advantages which are external to, and which surround the body, but the deprivation or absence of them leaves him without the enjoyment or use of them, and man if deprived of all good protectors, and of the use of these enjoyments, is exposed to as much suffering, as he is capable of. Therefore he prays on behalf of he man, who has those things which are around and exterior to the body, that he may dwell in the house of the wise man, so that attending to the rules of all good men he may see, and regulate his own course by their example. Why because Ham had sinned did God pronounce that his son Canaan should be the servant of Ham and Japhet? In the first place, God pronounced this sentence because both father and son had displayed the same wickedness, being both united together, and not separated, and both indulging in the same disposition. But in the second place, he did so because the father would be exceedingly afflicted at the curse thus laid upon the son being sufficiently conscious that he was punished not so much for his own sake, as for that of his father. And so the leader and master of the two suffered the punishment of his wicked counsels, and words, and actions.
this is the literal meaning of the statement. But if we look to its inward meaning, then in reality they are no more two different men, than two different dispositions. And this is made plain by the names given to them, which manifestly denote the nature of the facts, for ham being interpreted means heat, or hot, and canon means merchants of causes. Why was it that Noah lived after the deluge 350 years? It is now declared, that in two periods of seven years the form of the world was originally created, and now renewed under Noah. But the wise man lives for a period of fourteen quarters of a century, and fourteen times twenty-five is equal to seven times fifty, or fifty times seven. And it is the principle of the seventh year, and also of the fiftieth, which has an especial order of its own explained and ordained in Leviticus. Why among the three sons of Noah does Ham appear always to occupy the middle place, but the two extremities are varied, for when their birth is mentioned, Shem is placed in the first rank, in this manner, Shem, Ham, and Japhet, but when they are spoken of as fathers, then Japhet is mentioned first, and the beginning of the enumeration of the nations is derived from Japhet himself. Those who inquire into the literal nature of the divine writings think thus of the order in which these men are mentioned, looking upon him, who is the first named, that is Shem, as the younger, and upon him, who is named the last, that is Japhet, as the elder. However they may choose to think of this let them, being guided by the principle of mere opinion. But we who look to the real meaning of these statements think that there is here a reference to the three things, good, bad, and indifferent, which last are called secondary goods, and we must therefore think that the secret writer always puts the bad in the middle. So that being confined at either extremity it may be subdued on one side by the one, and on the other side by the other, so that, being confined, it may be kept in and subdued. But the good and the indifferent, or secondary good, change the order with one another, for when there is such great evil present, and yet not holy, and altogether, the good rejoices in the first place, having the position of the dispenser and chief of the whole. But when it is placed in the position of the will in a state of conspiracy, and injustice remains not only in the intellect, but is also conducted to its end by unjust works, then that first good is changed from its original order into another place, together with all the good habits which depend upon it, rejecting all education, and all arrangement, as being wholly unable to attain its proposed end, just as a physician does when he sees an incurable disease. But the elder good manages that virtue which is around the body and exterior, to it, therefore, by observing the extremities with greater caution, and closing in the beast within its toils, it is sufficiently demonstrated that it does not dare to bite or injure any more. But while it feels that it has done no injury, it is transferred into a more secure and more permanent position, and then, a higher and better fortified place being assigned to it, it easily retains the lower position too, as one easy to be preserved, for... In consequence of the superior power of its guardian, it is always practicable to watch it closely, since nothing is more mighty than virtue. Why do the people of Sias, and of Rhodes, and the Isles of the Gentles, spring from Japhet? Since he has the name denoting breadth, namely Japhet, being expanded in his growth and increase, that part of the things of the world which have been assigned by nature, for the use of mankind, that is to say the earth can no longer hold him, therefore he passes over into the other part, that is to say, the sea, and the islands belonging to it. This is the literal meaning of the statement. But if we look to its inner sense, all the external blessings which are bestowed by nature, such as riches, and honor, and principalities, are lavished and poured forth in every direction on those men into whose hands they come, and are also extended widely to others, who are not so much within reach, so that in a greater, or at all events, in no less a degree do they surround, and hem the man in, in accordance with the greediness of the lovers of riches and glory. Since they are eager for principalities, and are never satisfied, because of their insatiable desires, why the eldest son of Ham is Chus? 
The sacred historian has here produced a word most completely in accordance with nature, saying that Chusp was the elder son of evil, Chusp being the dissolved and loose nature of the earth, for the earth, when dense and fertile, and moist, is full of herbs, and hills, and trees, and is well arranged for the production of different fruits, but when dissolved and reduced to dust and dry, it is unfruitful and barren, and besides it is tossed about in the air. When it is raised from the ground by the wind, by its dust making the air all alive. Such as this is the first origin, and the first shoots of evil being destitute of the generation of good pursuits, and the cause of barrenness to the soul, and to all its parts. Why was just the father of Nimrod, who began to be a giant, and a hunter, before the Lord, on which account they said, like Nimrod the mighty hunter, before the Lord. The father in this case, having a nature truly dissolute, does not at all keep fast the spiritual bond of the soul, nor of nature, nor of consistency of manners, but rather like a giant born of the earth, prefers earthly to heavenly things, and thus appears to verify the ancient fable of the giants and titans, for in truth he, who is an emulator of earthly and corruptible things is always engaged in a conflict with heavenly and admirable natures, raising up earth, as a bulwark against heaven. And those things which are below are adverse to those which are above. On which account there is much propriety in the expression, he was a giant against God, which thus declares the opposition of such beings, to the deity, for a wicked man is nothing else than an enemy, contending against God. On which account it has become a proverb, that everyone, who sins greatly ought to be referred to him, as the original and chief of sinners, being spoken of as a second Nimrod. Therefore his very name is an indication of his character, for it is interpreted Ethiopian, and his art is that of hunting, both of which things are detestable, and Ethiopian, because unmitigated wickedness has no participation in light, but imitates night and darkness, and the practice of the huntsman is as much as possible at variance with rational nature, for he who lives among wild beasts wishes to live the life of a beast, and to be equal to the brutes in the vices of wickedness. And if you yourself say that he is, show us, either some command from him, or some letter, or something of the kind, that we, who have been sent to you as ambassadors, may cease to trouble you, and may address our supplications to your master. But this last sentence exasperated him in the greatest possible degree as he feared lest they might in reality go on an embassy to the emperor, and might impeach him with respect to other particulars of his government, in respect of his corruption, and his acts of insolence, and his rapine, and his habit of insulting people, and his cruelty, and his continual murders of people untried, and uncondemned, and his never-ending, and gratuitous, and most grievous inhumanity. Therefore, being exceedingly angry, and being at all times a man of most ferocious passions, he was in great perplexity, neither venturing to take down what he had once set up, nor wishing to do anything which could be acceptable to his subjects, and at the same time being sufficiently acquainted with the firmness of Tiberius, on these points. And those who were in power in our nation, seeing this, and perceiving that he was inclined to change his mind, as to what he had done, but that he was not willing to be thought to do so, wrote a most supplicatory letter to Tiberius. And he, when he had read it, what did he say of Pilate, and what threats did he utter against him? But it is beside our purpose at present to relate to you, how very angry he was, although he was not very liable to sudden anger, since the facts speak for themselves, for immediately, without putting anything off till the next day, he wrote a letter, reproaching, and reviling him in the most bitter manner for his act of unprecedented audacity and wickedness, and commanding him immediately to take down the shields, and to convey them away from the metropolis of Judea to Caesarea. On the sea which had been named Caesarea Augusta, after his grandfather, in order, that they might be set up in the temple of Augustus. And accordingly, they were set up in that edifice. And in this way he provided for two matters, both for the honor due to the emperor, and for the preservation of the ancient customs of the city. Now the things set up on that occasion were shields, on which there was no representation of any living thing whatever engraved. 
but now the thing proposed to be erected is a colossal statue. Moreover, then the erection was in the dwelling house of the governor, but they say that which is now contemplated is to be in the inmost part of the temple, in the very holy of holies itself, into which once in the year the high priest enters on the day called the great fast to offer incense, and on no other day being then about in accordance with our national law also to offer up prayers for a fertile and ample supply of blessings and for peace of all mankind. And if any one else, I will not say of the Jews, but even of the priests, and those not of the lowest order, but even those who are in the rank next to the first, should go in there, either with him or after him, or even if the very high priest himself should enter in thither on two days, in the year, or three, or four times on the same day, he is subjected to inevitable death for his impiety. So great are the precautions taken by our lawgiver with respect to the Holy of Holies, as he determined to preserve it alone inaccessible to and untouched by any human being. How many deaths then do you not suppose that the people, who have been taught to regard this place with such holy reverence, would willingly endure rather than see a statue introduced into it? I fairly believe that they would rather slay all their whole families, with their wives and children, and themselves last of all, in the ruins of their houses and families, and Tiberius knew this well. And what did your great-grandfather, the most excellent of all emperors, that ever lived upon the earth, he, who was the first to have the appellation of Augustus given him, on account of his virtue, and good fortune, he, who diffused peace? in every direction over or thancy, to the very furthest extremities of the world? Did not he, when he had heard a report of the peculiar characteristics of our temple, and that there is in it no image or representation made by hands, no visible likeness of him, who is invisible, no attempt at any imitation of his nature, did not he, I say, marvel at and honor it? For as he was imbued with something more than a mere smattering of philosophy, inasmuch, as he had deeply feasted on it, and continued to feast on it every day, he partly retraced in his recollection all the precepts of philosophy which his mind had previously learned, and partly also he kept his learning alive by the conversation of the literary men, who were always about him, for at his banquets and entertainments, the greatest part of the time was devoted to learned conversation in order that not only his friends' bodies, but their minds also might be nourished. And though I might be able to establish this fact, and demonstrate to you the feelings of Augustus, your great-grandfather, by an abundance of proofs, I will be content with two, for, in the first place, he sent commandments to all the governors of the different provinces throughout Asia, because he heard that the sacred first fruits were neglected, enjoining them to permit the Jews alone to assemble together in the synagogues, for that these assemblies were not revels, which from drunkenness and intoxication proceeded to violence, so as to disturb the peaceful condition of the country, but were rather schools of temperance and justice, as the men who met in them were studiers of virtue, and contributed the first fruits every year, sending commissioners to convey the holy things to the temple in Jerusalem, and, in the next place, he commanded that no one should hinder the Jews, either on their way, to the synagogues, or one bringing their contributions, or one proceeding in obedience to their national laws to Jerusalem. For these things were expressly enjoined, if not in so many words, at all events in effect, and I subjoin one letter, in order to bring conviction, to you, who are our mater what Gaius Norbanus Flaccus wrote, in which he details what had been written to him by Caesar. And the superscription of the letter is as follows, Caius Norbanus Flaccus, proconsul, to the governors of the Ephesians, greeting. Caesar has written word to me, that the Jews, wherever they are, are accustomed to assemble together, in compliance with a peculiar ancient custom of their nation, to contribute money which they send to Jerusalem and he does not choose that they should have any hindrance offered to them, to prevent them from doing this, therefore I have written to you, that you may know that I command that they shall be allowed to do these things. 
is not this a most convincing proof, O Emperor, of the intention of Caesar respecting the honors paid to our temple which he had adopted, not considering it right that because of some general rule, with respect to meetings, the assemblies of the Jews, in one place should be put down, which they held for the sake of offering the first fruits, and for other pious objects. There is also another piece of evidence, in no respect inferior to this one, and which is the most undeniable proof of the will of Augustus, for he commanded perfect sacrifices of whole burnt offerings, to be offered up to the Most High God every day, out of his own revenues, which are performed up to the present time, and the victims are to sheep, and a bull, with which Caesar honored the altar of God, well knowing that there is in the temple no image erected either in open sight or in any secret part of it. But that great ruler, who was inferior to no one in philosophy, considered within himself that it is necessary in terrestrial things, that an especial holy place should be set apart for the invisible God, who will not permit any visible representation of himself to be made, by which to arrive at a participation in favorable hopes, and the enjoyment of perfect blessings. And your grandmother, Julia Augusta, following the example of so great a guide in the paths of piety, did also adorn the temple with some golden vials and censers, and with a great number of other offerings, of the most costly and magnificent description. And what was her object, in doing this, when there is no statue erected within the temple? For the minds of women are, in some degree, weaker than those of men, and are not so well able to comprehend a thing which is appreciable only by the intellect, without any aid of objects addressed to the outward senses, but she, as she surpassed all her sex in other particulars, so also was she superior to them in this, by reason of the pure learning and wisdom which had been implanted in her, both by nature, and by study, so that, having a masculine intellect, she was so sharp-sighted and profound, that she comprehended what is appreciable only by the intellect, even more than those things which are perceptible by the outward senses, and looked upon the latter, as only shadows of the former. Therefore, O Master, having all these examples most nearly connected with yourself and your family, of our purposes and customs, derived from those from whom you are sprung, of whom you are born, and by whom you have been brought up, I implore you to preserve those principles which each of those persons whom I have mentioned did preserve they who were themselves possessed of imperial power do, by their laws, exhort you, the emperor, they who were august, speak to you, who are also Augustus. Your grandfathers and ancestors speak to their descendant. Numbers of authorities address one individual, all, but saying, in express words, do not you destroy those things in our councils which remain, and which have been preserved as permanent laws to this very day, for even if no mischief were to ensue from the abrogation of them, still, at all events, the result would be a feeling of uncertainty respecting the future, and such uncertainty is full of fear, even to the most sanguine and confident. If they are not despisers of divine things, if I were to enumerate the benefits which I myself have received at your hands, the day would be too short for me, besides the fact that it is not proper for one who has undertaken to speak on one subject to branch off to a digression about some other matter. And even if I should be silent, the facts themselves speak, and utter a distinct voice. You released me when I was bound in chains and iron. Who is there who is ignorant of this? But do not, after having done so, O Emperor, bind me in bonds of still greater bitterness, for the chains from which you released me surrounded a part of my body, but those which I am now anticipating are the chains of the soul, which are likely to oppress it wholly, and in every part, you abated from me a fear of death, continually suspended over my head, you received me, when I was almost dead through fear, you raised me up as it were from the dead. Continue your favor, O Master, that your group may not be driven wholly to forsake life, for I shall appear, if you do not do so, to have been released from bondage, not for the purpose of being saved, but for that of being made to perish in a more conspicuous manner. You have given me the greatest and most glorious inheritance among mankind, the rank and power of a king, 
at first over one district, then over another and a more important one, adding to my kingdom the district called Trachonitis and Galilee. Do not then, O Master, after having loaded me with means of superfluity, deprive me of what is actually necessary. Do not, after you have raised me up to the most brilliant light, cast me down again from my eminence to the most profound darkness. I am willing to descend from this splendid position in which you have placed me, I do not deprecate to return to the condition in which I was a short time ago. I will give up everything. I look upon everything as of less importance, and the one point of preserving the ancient customs and laws of my nation unaltered, for if they are violated, what could I say, either to my fellow countrymen, or to any other men? It would follow of necessity that I must be looked upon as one of two things, either as a betrayer of my people, or as one who is no longer accounted a friend by you. And what could be a greater misery? than either of these two things. For if I am still reckoned among the company of your friends, I shall then receive the imputation of treason against my own nation, if neither my country is preserved free from all misfortune, nor even the temple left inviolate. For you, great men, preserve the property of your companions, and of those who take refuge in your protection by your imperial splendor and magnificence. And if you have any secret grief or vexation in your mind, do not throw me into prison, like Tiberius, but deliver me from any anticipation of being thrown into prison at any future time. Command me at once to be put out of the way. For what advantage would it be to me to live, who place my whole hopes of safety and happiness in your friendship and favor? Having written this letter and sealed it, he sent it to Gaius, and then shutting himself up he remained in his own house, full of agony, confusion, and disorder, and anxiety as to what was the best way of approaching and addressing the emperor, for he and his people had incurred no slight danger, but they had reason to apprehend expulsion from their country, and slavery, and utter destruction, as impending not only over those who were dwelling in the Holy Land, but over all the Jews in every part of the world. But the emperor, having taken the letter, and read it, and having considered every suggestion which was contained in it, was very angry, because his intentions had not been executed, and yet, at the same time, he was moved by the appeals to his justice, and by the supplications which were thus addressed to him, and in some respects he was pleased with Agrippa, and in some he blamed him, he blamed him for his excessive desire to please his fellow countrymen who were the only men who had resisted his orders and shown any unwillingness to submit to his deification. But he praised him for concealing and disguising none of his feelings, which conduct he said was a proof of a liberal and noble disposition. Therefore being somewhat appeased, at least as far as appearance went, he condescended to return a somewhat favorable answer, granting to Agrippa, that highest and greatest of all favors, the consent, that this erection of his statue should not take place, and he commanded letters, to be written to Publius Petronius the governor of Syria, enjoining him not to allow any alterations or innovations, to be made with respect to the temple of the Jews, Nevertheless, though he did grant him the favor, he did not grant it without any alloy, but he mingled with it a grievous terror, for he added to the letter, dash if any people, in the bordering countries, with the exception of the metropolis itself, wishing to erect altars or temples, nay, images of statues, in honor of me and of my family are hindered from doing so. I charge you at once to punish those who attempt to hinder them, or else to bring them before the tribunal. Now this was nothing else but a beginning of seditions and civil wars and an indirect way of annulling the gift which he appeared to be granting. For some men, more out of a desire of mortifying the Jews and from any feelings of loyalty towards Gaius were inclined to fill the whole country with erections of one kind or another. But they who beheld the violation of their national customs practiced before their eyes were resolved above all things not to endure such an injury unresistingly. But Gaius, judging those who were thus excited to disobedience to be worthy of the most severe punishment possible, a second time orders his statue to be erected in the temple. 
but by the providence and care of God, who beholds all things, and governs all things in accordance with justice, not one of the neighboring nations made any movement at all, so that there was no occasion for these commands being carried into effect, and these inexorably appointed calamities all terminated in only a moderate degree of blame. What advantage, then, was gained? Someone will say, for even when they were quiet, Gaius was not quiet, but he had already repented of the favor which he had showed to Agrippa, and had rekindled the desires which he had entertained a little while before, for he commanded another statue to be made, of colossal size, of brass gilt over, in Rome, no longer moving the one which had been made in Sidon, in order that the people might not be excited by its being moved but that while they remained in a state of tranquility, and felt released from their suspicions, it might in a period of peace be suddenly brought to the country in a ship, and be suddenly erected without the multitude being aware of what was going on. And he was intending to do this while on his voyage along the coast during the period which he had allotted for his sojourn in Egypt. For an indescribable desire occupied his mind, to see Alexandria, to which he was eager to go with all imaginable haste, and when he had arrived there he intended to remain a considerable time, urging that the deification about which he was so anxious, might easily be originated and carried to a great height, in that city, above all others, and then that it would be a model to all other cities of the adoration to which he was entitled. Inasmuch as it was the greatest of all the cities of the East, and built in the finest situation in the world, for all inferior men and nations are eager to imitate great men and great states. Moreover, Gaius was in other respects a man in whose nature there was nothing stable or trustworthy so that, even if he did anything good or kind, he speedily repented of it, and in such a manner, that he soon attempted to annul what he had done in such a way as to cause even greater affliction and injury to those whom he had favored. For instance, he released some prisoners and then for no reason whatever he threw them into prison a second time, inflicting upon them a second calamity more grievous than the first, namely, that which was caused by unexpected misfortune. Again, he condemned some persons to banishment, who had expected sentence of death, not because they were conscious of having committed crimes deserving of death, or indeed of any punishment at all even the lightest, but because of the extravagant inhumanity of their master they did not expect to escape. Now to these men, banishment was a downright gain, and equivalent almost to a restoration, since they looked upon it that they had escaped the greatest of all evils, the danger of death. But no long period elapsed before he sent some soldiers, after them, though no new circumstances had arisen, and put to death simultaneously the most excellent, and nobly born of the exiles, who were living in the different islands, as their own countries, and who were bearing their misfortunes, in the most contented manner, inflicting in this way the greatest and most pitiable and unexpected misery on many of the noblest families in Rome. And if he ever gave any one a sum of money, as a gift, he demanded it back again at some future time not a simple loan, but he also required interest and compound interest, and often treating the persons themselves, who had received it from him as thieves, and punishing them with the severest penalties, for having stolen it, for he was not contented that those miserable men should return what had been given to them, but he compelled them also to give up all their property which they had inherited from their parents, or relations, or from any friends or which, having selected a life of industry and profit, they had acquired by their own resources. And those who appeared to be in the greatest credit with him, and who lived with him in a round of pleasure, as one may say, with great appearances of friendship and goodwill, were greatly injured by him, being compelled to expend large sums in irregular, and illegal, and sudden journeys, and in entertainments, for they lavished whole properties, in the preparation of a single banquet, so that they were compelled to have recourse to usurers, so vast was his prodigality. Therefore many men deprecated the receiving of any favors from him, thinking not only that it was of no advantage, but even that they were only a bait, and a snare to lead them into intolerable suffering. 
so great therefore was his inequality of temper towards every one, and most especially towards the nation of the Jews, to which he was most bitterly hostile, and accordingly beginning in Alexandria he took from them all their synagogues there, and in the other cities, and filled them all with images and statues of his own form, for not caring about any other erection of any kind, he set up his own statue everywhere by main force, and the great temple, in the holy city, which was left untouched to the last, having been thought worthy of all possible respect and preservation, he altered and transformed into a temple of his own, that he might call it the temple of the new Jupiter, the illustrious Gaius. What is this that you say? Do you, who are a man, seek to take to yourself the air, and the heaven, not being content with the vast multitude of continents, and islands, and nations, and countries of which you enjoy the sovereignty? And do you not think any one of the gods, who are worshipped in that city, or by our people worthy of any country or city, or even of any small precinct which may have been consecrated to them in old time, and dedicated to them with oracles, and sacred hymns, and are you intending to deprive them of that? That in all the vast circumference of the world there may be no visible trace or memorial, to be found of any honor, or pious worship paid to the true real living God. Truly you are suggesting fine hopes to the race of mankind, are you ignorant that you are opening the fountains of evils of every kind, making innovations, and committing acts of audacious impiety such, as it is wicked to do and even to think of? It is worthwhile to make mention of what we both saw, and heard, when we were sent forth to encounter a contest on behalf of our national constitution. For the moment that we entered into the presence of the emperor we perceived, from his looks, and from the state of agitation, in which he was, that we had come not before a judge, but before an accuser, or rather I should say before the open enemy of those whom he looked upon as opposed to his will. For it would have been the part of a judge to sit with the censors selected because of their virtue, and learning, when a question of the greatest importance was being investigated which had lain dormant for four hundred years, and which was now raised for the first time among many myriads of Alexandrian Jews, and it would have been proper for the contending parties with their advocates to stand on each side of him, and for him to listen to them both in turn first to the accusation and then in turn to the defense, according to a period measured by water, and then retiring the judge should deliberate with his assessors, as to what he ought publicly to deliver as his sentence on the justice of the case, but what was actually done resembled rather the conduct of an implacable tyrant, exhibiting uncontrolled authority, and displeasure and pride. For besides that he in no particular behaved in the manner which I have just been describing as proper. Having sent for the managers of the gardens, the Messinadian, and the Lamian garden, and they are near one another, and close to the city, in which he had spent three or four days, for that was the place in which this theatrical spectacle, aimed at the happiness of a whole nation, was intended to be enacted in our presence, he commanded all the outer buildings to be open for him. For that he wished to examine them all minutely, but we, as soon as we were introduced into his presence, the moment that we saw him, bent to the ground with all imaginable respect and adoration, and saluted him calling him the Emperor Augustus, and he replied to us in such a gentle and courteous and humane manner, that we not only despaired of attaining our object, but even of preserving our lives, for, said he, you are haters of God. Inasmuch as you do not think that I am a God, I, who am already confessed to be a God, by every other nation, but who am refused that appellation by you. And then, stretching up his hands to heaven, he uttered an ejaculation which it was impious to hear, much more would it be so to repeat it literally. And immediately all the ambassadors of the opposite portion were filled with all imaginable joy, thinking that their embassy was already successful, on account of the first words uttered by Gaius, and so they clapped their hands and danced for joy, and called him by every title which is applicable to any one of the gods. 
and while he was triumphing in these superhuman appellations, the sycophant Isidorus, seeing the temper in which he was, said, O oh master, you will hate with still juster vehemence these men, whom you see before you and their fellow countrymen, if you are made acquainted with their disaffection and disloyalty towards yourself. For when all other men were offering up sacrifices of thanksgiving for your safety, these men alone refused to offer any sacrifice at all. And when I say, these men, I comprehend all the rest of the Jews. And when we all cried out with one accord, O Lord Gaius, we are falsely accused, for we did sacrifice, and we offered up entire hecatombs, the blood of which we poured in libation upon the altar, and the flesh we did not carry to our homes, to make a feast and banquet upon it, as it is the custom of some people, to do. But we committed the victims entire to the sacred flame, as a burnt offering, and we have done this three times already. And not once only, on the first occasion, when you succeeded to the empire, and the second time, when you are recovered from that terrible disease with which all the habitable world was afflicted at the same time, and the third time we sacrificed in hope of your victory over the Germans. Grant, said he, that all this is true and that you did sacrifice, nevertheless you sacrificed to another god, and not for my sake, and then what good did you do me? Moreover you did not sacrifice to me immediately a profound shuddering came upon us the first moment, that we heard this expression, similar to that which overwhelmed us when we first came into his presence. And while he was saying this he entered into the outer buildings, examining the chambers of the men, and the chambers of the women, and the rooms on the ground floor, and all the apartments in the upper story, and blaming some points of their preparation as defective, and planning alterations, and suggesting designs, and giving orders himself to make them more costly, and then we being driven about in this way followed him up and down through the whole place. Being mocked and ridiculed by our adversaries, like people at a play in the theatre, for indeed the whole matter was a kind of farce, the judge assumed the part of an accuser, and the accusers the part of an unjust judge, who look upon the defendants with an eye of hostility, and act in accordance with the nature of truth. And when a judge invested with such mighty power begins to reproach the person who is on his trial, before him it is necessary to be silent, for it is possible even to defend oneself in silence, and especially for people who are able to make no reply on any of the subjects which he was not investigating, and desiring to understand, inasmuch as our laws and our customs restrained our tongues, and shut and sewed up our mouths. But when he had given some of his orders about the buildings, he then asked a very important and solemn question, why is it that you abstain from eating pig's flesh? And then again at this question such a violent laughter was raised by our adversaries, partly, because they were really delighted, and partly, as they wished to court the emperor out of flattery, and therefore wished to make it appear that this question was dictated by wit, and uttered with grace, that some of the servants who were following him were indignant at their appearing to treat the emperor with so little respect. Since it was not safe for his most intimate friends to do so much as smile at his words. And when we made answer that different nations have different laws, and there are some things of which the use of forbidden both to us and to our adversaries, and when someone said, There are also many people who do not eat lamb's flesh, which is the most tender of all meat, he laughed and said, They are quite right, for it is not nice. Being joked with and trifled with and ridiculed in this manner, we were in great perplexity, and at last he said in a rapid and peremptory manner, I desire to know what principles of justice you recognize with regard to your constitution. And when we began to reply to him, and to explain that he, as soon as he had a taste of our pleading on the principles of justice, and as soon as he perceived that our arguments were not contemptible, before we could bring forward the more important things which we had to say, cut us short, and ran forward, and burst into the principal building. And as soon as he had entered he commanded the windows which were around it to be filled up with the transparent pebbles very much resembling white crystal which do not hinder the light, 
but which keep out the wind and the heat of the sun then proceeding on deliberately he asked in a more moderate tone, What are you saying? And when we began to connect our reply with what we had said before, he again ran on and went into another house in which he had commanded some ancient and admirable pictures to be placed. But when our pleadings on behalf of justice were thus broken up and cut short and interrupted and crushed, as one may almost say, we, being wearied and exhausted, and having no strength left in us but being in continual expectation of nothing else than death, could not longer keep our hearts, as they had been, but in our agony we took refuge in supplications to the one true God, praying him to check the wrath of this falsely called God. And he took compassion on us and turned his mind to pity. And he becoming pacified merely said, These men do not appear to me to be wicked so much as unfortunate and foolish in not believing that I have been endowed with the nature of God. And so he dismissed us and commanded us to depart. Having then escaped from what was rather a theatre, and a prison, and a court of justice, for as in a theatre, there was a great noise of people hissing, and groaning, and ridiculing us in an extravagant manner, and, as in a prison, there were many blows inflicted on our bodies, and tortures, and things to agitate our whole souls by the blasphemies which those around us uttered against the deity, and the threats which they breathed forth against ourselves and which the emperor himself poured forth with such vehemence, being indignant with us not in behalf of any one else, for in that case he would soon have been appeased, but because of himself and his great desire, to be declared a god, in which desire he considered that the Jews were the only people, who did not acquiesce, and who were unable to subscribe to it, we at last recovered our breath, not because we had been afraid of death from a base hankering after life, since we would have cheerfully embraced death as immortality, if our laws and customs could have been established by such means, but because we knew that we should be destroyed with great ignominy without any desirable object being secured by such means, for whatever insults ambassadors are subjected to are at all times referred to those who sent them. It was owing to these considerations that we were able to hold up our heads, for a while, but there were other circumstances which terrified us and kept us in great perplexity and distress to hear what the emperor would decide, and what he would pronounce, and what kind of a sentence he would ultimately deliver, for he heard the general tenor of our arguments, though he disdained to attend to some of our facts. But would it not be a terrible thing for the interests of all the Jews, throughout the whole world, to be thrown into confusion by the treatment to which we its five ambassadors, were exposed. For if he were to give us up to our enemies, what other city could enjoy tranquility? What city would there be in which the citizens would not attack the Jews living in it? What synagogue would be left uninjured? What state would not overturn every principle of justice in respect of those of their countrymen, who arrayed themselves in opposition to the national laws and customs of the Jews, they will be overthrown, they will be shipwrecked, they will be sent to the bottom, with all the particular laws of the nation, and those too which are common to all, and in accordance with the principles of justice recognized in every city. We, then, being overwhelmed with affliction, in our misery perplexed ourselves with such reasonings, as these, for even those who up to this time had seemed to cooperate with us were now wearied of taking our part, Therefore, when we called them forth, they being within, did not remain, but came forth privily in fear, knowing well the desire which the emperor had to be looked upon as God. We have now related in a concise and summary manner the cause of the hatred of Gaius to the whole nation of the Jews, we must now proceed to make our palinode to Gaius, 